Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. If you are new to the channel, welcome. For those of you returning, thank you oh so much for coming back to check out another educational episode of This is Revolution Podcast, Saturday Free Show. If you are new and you haven't done it already, please hit the like and subscribe button. Don't forget to hit the bell so you are notified as we are adding new programming constantly to the channel. And today we're going to be talking about Russia, 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 and what's going on with the Ukraine. But before I get into what we're going to be talking about, let's introduce our host. You know him as the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Oh, Jesus. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Night of the Comet. That is one of my favorite movies from the 80s. You remember Haley's comment? Yes. You remember all the uh, hubbub around Haley's comment? Because it Not comes much. Like 80 or 91 years or whatever. This movie was made kind of uh, in reaction to all the nonsense that was going around around Haley's comment. It's a zombie movie that's very, very pro US occupation of Central America. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel enriched that you shared that with me. Oh yeah, no, you should. You should check it out. Uh, some Cold War propaganda hiding in a horror film. I'm working through the uh, Bill Cosby documentary about Bill Cosby. I watched part one last night, and uh, I will save all comments for off air, and then the show we did. Were you traumatized? Um, I have some opinions. Okay, we'll talk about it then. Yeah, that's it's definitely an off-air conversation. Speaking of off-air conversations, let me bring in the other black guy. He's my co-host in the new sports show, Beyond the Red Zone, that we just launched on Monday. He's right now every black person's favorite person to bring on their show to talk about what we should do with the Ukraine. He is foreign policy expert, <laughs> Marcus of the Left Flag Vets. Don't, 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 don't say foreign policy expert. Okay, that's that's too weighted, way too weighted. So I just I start ranting about how um, anyone saying, "Well, what are we gonna do about Putin?" You know, they're just puppets of the military industrial complex. They hit my computer with the Havana syndrome gun. You know, so if my if my internet goes out, it's because I it's my my proximity to uh to the deep state, to the military industrial complex and their uh their influence. So yeah, it's been going on. But yeah, no Mickey Do they make you wear your old military uniform before you go on? Yeah, I mean it, you know, I always have it pressed and hanging up, you know? No. <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. shit and and rejoining us as he is dealing with a lot in the uk and i'm extremely happy to have our kurdish brother back with us he's everybody's favorite hoodlum from hull he is mean jean bajlan greetings everybody greetings Pat. greetings Pascal. greetings jason and greetings marcus Comet cited minus two stability. Those in the chat who know what that means, you know what it means. It's code. But yeah, exciting <laughs> show today. We're going to be hitting up Russia. Uh, we're going to be hitting up the, uh, the the juice box that is Russia. And I think Marcus really start needs to start going on um, progressive podcasts wearing his military uniform. Because I think that would be super... <laughs> so cut his hair short. Get his military uniform on and sit there all, all uptight. 
So I, no. th- I think that would so that would lend you credibility. Hmm? And that, yeah. And I used I I didn't want, there was a time there was a time where you could play I played the card you know but uh, no longer no longer all right I still get my ten percent with the hair at Applebee's so <laughs> you don't have to wear the uniform <laughs> do you go you around getting military uniform. discounts everywhere you go I mean in places where I deem you know it very necessary just for cost savings purposes the weed store made we you're Golden gonna get Corral. mad at me for this you're gonna Golden get mad Corral at me for this is an part. important place to get your military discount. Yeah, well, if you know, you just got to make sure you stay away from the steak line. That's uh, <laughs> hey, Marcus. So, when I worked in the Gulf of Mexico, you have to get a merchant mariner's document, and so I would use that as my military. Hell, yes, <laughs> no, no, hey, I am very much, yes, hey, thank you for your service. Yeah, it was um, supposed to be like, thank you for your service. Yes, I was actually, like, I cooked for oil field workers. And well, next time, next time on, my dad's in yeah. the U.S., I should, I should try and convince him to uh, get his ID from when he did his national service in the Iraqi army in the 70s. The, so honestly, like, uh, you, you said work. military you didn't American, say which military. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, there's actually a sto- like a few stories going around where people in the Space Force are upset because they people don't believe them when they ask for their veterans discount um so baby i'm in the goddamn space force if you're gonna lie just don't use space force but steal the valor get your 10 percent off go for it hey it's, people are joking like thank you for your service but seriously that shit got me out of tickets when i was driving back home from yeah. louisiana play the card play the card oh i again. played the shit out of it they're like oh you work in the gulf i was like yeah yeah it's tough work out there in the gulf yes, sir i do it's hard sometimes. <laughs> Making a lot eggs. of good men out there. <laughs> a lot of good men out there. <laughs> Pascal, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good, man. <laughs> I feel kind of mellow. Wait, somebody asked in the chat, what's the Branson of England? There's a lot of Bransons in England, but I would say Skegness is the Branson of England. I think you just you made a word. Skegness? Yeah, Skegness. This sounds like a bad ska band. <laughs> what the fuck is got in the Pascal? <laughs> Skegness? Skegness? Skegness sounds like a disease you have after sex with a prostitute. What the hell is that? <laughs> That's actually a lightly scenario. Some kind of STD certainly could come with you out of Skegness. It's one of the places my brother goes wrestling. They do wrestling to us. And they go to Skagmas. It, hey, it's a holiday hey. resort on the beach. In Gene, Britain. Gene, 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 So people think that you have short hair, and someone responded, "That's not short hair. That's a ponytail." <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was short hair at first too. I told you the only people his age with ponytails are porn directors. In can the we battle. get a turn? Can we get a? Can I can we live get a, with that. I can live. Can with we get that. a profile? Can. Gee, can we get a turn to the? Oh, <laughs> God, yes. Are you gonna yeah. sprinkle the salt? You got like a little fade <laughs> on the sides and the ponytail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I got the haircut uh, thanks to racial capitalist solidarity. I went to a Kurdish barber in uh, in Anlaby, and we we had a little chit chat. It was fun. Nice. Don't you, you call me the rash. So Dusty's talking. <laughs> that's oh oh wow. oh wow oh wow wow oh wow that's an insult. So you look like the Vouch. Oh, oh the Vouch looks like me. There you go. Keep it real. Yeah, I, yeah it, it's pretty funny. It's <laughs> that's not a haircut. That's a ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my father didn't like it. He was like, he was like, go get a haircut. You look like a tramp. I'm like, okay, I'll go get a haircut. And I, I came back. He goes, you look like a hoodlum. <laughs> <laughs> he used the word hoodlum. Yeah. Oh, no. He said, you look like a hooligan. Mm. Oh, like, that's even worse. Aren't those the guys that beat people up during soccer games? They are. Or don't they usually beat black people up during soccer games? It depends on the football team. <laughs> That wasn't the answer we were looking for. You were supposed to say, oh, no, there's no was, racial tensions in yeah. merry old England. <laughs> it's the truth, though. It's the Do truth. you just have a problem with the queen and the daughter, man? She's like, 
I don't want that black baby in my family. No, he will not be royalty. You have yeah. all the you have all the issues with, um, well, the the conservative front Brent bench. They're all uh, Dessies. Well, there's not all of them. There's a bunch of Dessies. So we've solved racism in Britain. We have a bunch of people uh, who Idi Amin kicked out their parents, and now they work for the uh, now they work for the conservative party. So the Indo-Pakistani community in England has merged with the reactionary right on the political level. No, now. I think I think I think I think there's a tendency amongst, uh, and this is obviously a generalization. I think you could probably say that Afro-Indian lean conservative uh, in uh, in Britain. Someone says, born center, cold world. Gene looks like a middle-aged dad who carries a handgun to intimidate his daughter's boyfriend and listens to Joe Rogan. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you fucking nailed it. <laughs> God damn. Well, I want, before, before we actually start talking about real shit, and I'm so sorry, Haroon. I hope you're having a little bit of fun here in the, in the virtual green room. I can see Haroon right now just shaking his head. Um, I wanted to send this to you. And I don't know why I didn't send it to you. And I apologize for that. I think I was just leaving you alone because I know you're just so busy with family shit. Um, there was a riot in the Golden Corral. And they were throwing chairs all because someone asked for a medium rare steak and some horrible man asked for a well done steak. Ooh. So of course, yeah. Who wants to eat beef jerky? So the the guy that ordered the rare steak, of course, got it first, right? It doesn't take that long. Right. But he had ordered after the well done man. Well done man doesn't understand how meat is cooked and a fight happened. They were throwing tables, Gene at each other how, how dare they desecrate a, the holy sanctuary that is golden corral it was a nightmare what is, this, what is the american society coming to when you can't I, even have civilized behavior in a golden corral if you would have watched it i know a tear would have went down your cheek as you saw the fucking chocolate i don't think I, I don't i don't think i could watch it I, I, the, the destruction of a golden corral they <laughs> I've never seen anything like that in my life. I'm from the inner city where this shit happens quite often. <laughs> I've seen all kinds of shit at McDonald's and Jack in the Box and downtown San Francisco. I've never seen anyone pick up actual furniture like that and throw it at other people. Women, pregnant women, it didn't matter. They were baby awful. seats. The baby, the they high threw everything. Did you see it, Marcus? They yes. threw everything. It was nuts. And I was like, I know Gene has to, I know this has to have filtered down to the UK news. And I guess it did not. I missed it. I've been too busy, been too busy in the UK to follow Golden Corral updates. <laughs> <laughs> Pascal is not impressed. <laughs> We should, we should get we need to get to the we need to get to the the meat to the meat of the subject yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well russia has been in the news again over the apparent troops build up on the ukrainian border this is leading to some fiery rhetoric coming out of the u.s political and media establishment and fears of war Russia, on the flip side, denies hostile intent and is framing the issue as a reaction to NATO expansion eastwards. The Ukrainian crisis comes hot on the heels of a Russian-led intervention into the Central Asian state of Kazakhstan. Given all this, we here at TIR thought it might be a good idea to discuss some of the broader historical context to recent events with our very special guest. Are you guys ready? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. He is a historian of the Soviet Union, a lecturer at Queen Mary's in London, and someone who has written specifically on the history of both the Ukraine and Kazakhstan. He is Dr. Arun Wilmas.
Welcome. Hi. I, uh, uh, well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not an illiterate person as you introduced me, actually. Uh, what's Golden Corral? Golden Corral is a uh, buffet. buffet restaurant that oh, specializes in chocolate fondue fountains and steaks to order. Okay, right. Buffy. Golden Corral is endemic of all that is wrong with America. Greed, overindulgence. <laughs> I'm, I'm being sarcastic. No, it's He's all actually being buffet. very serious. Golden what did you go to get to? It's is also the place. Huh? It's Golden Corral gives Haroon. you so much meat, Haroon, that depending on where you, like, I've walked into some really wicked farts at Golden Corrals. Because people get some wicked meat farts. I see. But it is very overindulgent, and uh, they have a steak night that is kind of intense. And that's why Jean likes it. <laughs> well, Just you know who else likes it? Every every Eastern European person who has come to uh, Springfield to visit, and there have been a couple, have said Golden Corral is their favorite restaurant. You can eat for like 15, 20 bucks. You can eat so much food that you, won't, you won't be hungry the next day a week's worth of calories yeah i've and done that several times if you don't have an odd actually with we, we should stop bag, this if you know? sarah if sarah's watching this she told me specifically don't talk about golden corral <laughs> <laughs> does she know about the fight she do, i don't think she knows about the fight we we haven't been to golden corral since COVID. oh so she misses it mm. I don't know if she misses it. I don't think that's the the correct don't word for it. it. Don't mention the golden corral. Because Zal wrote like golden corral is where you go if you your money is tight and your expectations are low. Yes, there you got it exactly. <laughs> that's pretty much golden corral, and and you only find them, Harun, in like the um, the suburbs. They're never in a big city. And is it like all over America, like not only in California, not in the East Coast? It's a huge yeah. chain, very popular wow. in the Midwest. Very, very, okay. very big in the suburbs of the United States. So once you get out of a major metropolitan area, I think that's part of the business model. It's It has to be so many miles outside of a, a major city. But it well, is. Next time. <clears throat> yeah, when next you come back to the, the States, US, we'll take you to a Golden Corral and then you will we'll take you to a uh, good old fashioned uh, racial fight. <laughs> Big old American racial fight. Uh, I, I, I think I don't need the dessert part. I can just eat the main. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on right now? With uh, I, I think we have to get some 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 context. Let's begin with Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Can you give us a brief historical outline of Russia's relationship with Kazakhstan? Sure. Um, <clears throat> um, for the ones who are not very much familiar with the geography of Kazakhstan, it's in Central Asia between Russia, China, and uh, uh, yeah, next to uh, north of Afghanistan, south of Russia west of china let's say so it's in the right at the center of eurasian uh, continental mass so um kazakhs are ethnolinguistically a uh, turkic people and they were uh, historically they were pastoral nomads uh, in one word they they lived like the american indians you know they had their um, uh, and they they constantly uh, traveled one from one spot to another seasonal they were moving seasonally up and down in a huge step which is actually the uh, size of uh, western europe right um, and um, that's the historic uh, case um, they were uh, pastoral nomads and um, and um, the today's Kazakhstan or the Kazakh steppe was incorporated into the Russian Empire in the 18th, 19th centuries, gradually, because it's a big territory. Um, and it was a it was a long story, like uh, 
chunks of it became part of the empire and then another chunk. And um, after the revolution, the region became part of the Soviet Union. And another milestone probably in the history of Kazakhs, Kazakhstan is uh, in 1932, they experienced an artificial famine um, and uh, more than a million Kazakhs died. Uh, there are discussions, historic, historic, historical discussions about the cause of it, implementation of the central policies, who did what at the local level. But ultimately, the um, Communist Party of the Soviet Union um, and Stalin, as the head of the party, um, head of the government, uh, was responsible um, uh, for this uh, catastrophe. Uh, so more than a million Kazakhs died in one, one and a half year uh, in, in this artificial famine. And um, if you consider that the Kazakh population at that time was around 3 million, um, so half of the population uh, perished. Uh, so it was a huge blow. And um, that's why in the following decades, Kazakhs were uh, a minority in their own uh, land. Uh, up until 19... Uh, 90s, uh, 80s, 90s, uh, that was the case. And um, there were a lot of um, forced migrations towards Kazakhstan by the Soviet government or encouraged migrations, uh, internal migration uh, from other parts of the Soviet Union to Kazakhstan. That's why they couldn't uh, catch up, the birth rate of Kazakhs uh, could not catch up with the uh, immigration of other ethnicities to Kazakhstan after 1932 uh, uh, disaster um, and uh, that's why they constantly uh, remained uh, as a minority um, but now that's not the case um, many ethnic Russians uh, moved from Kazakhstan to Russia uh, or Ukrainians uh, German there was a big German minority they moved to Germany um, there were a lot of, uh, there are still a lot of uh, different ethnicities, Koreans, Kurds, um, you know, Georgians, Turks, uh, different ethnicities. Um, thanks to the Soviet settlement policies, uh, some forced settlement policies, but um, that's the case. Now they're in my majority, now that they're in majority in their own uh, republic. Um, so most of the Kazakhs became sedentary. They were settled, um, forcibly settled, uh, said became sedentary after the 1930s. Um, and during the Second World War, a large number of factories and industrial, industrial experts uh, along those factories uh, were moved to Kazakhstan, um, you know, during the German uh, Nazi occupation of the Soviet Union uh, when the German forces reach uh, the gates of Moscow, Stalingrad and Leningrad. Um, um, thousands of uh, uh, production lines, factories, uh, they were uh, dismantled as much as they could. Uh, I mean, as much as the authorities could at the time, Soviet authorities and they were moved to Siberia uh, and to Central Asia, to Kazakhstan. Uh, and of course, with those factories and production lines, of course, moved uh, workers and uh, technicians, engineers, experts along those, uh, uh, together with those uh, factories and production lines. And that was the, in a way, uh, the beginning of the industrialization of Kazakh economy. Um, uh, that took took off with this uh, wave uh, during the war. Um, so like the Ukraine, coal mines in Ukraine were lost to Germans for nearly two years. They had to exploit and um, uh, find uh, mines, if the coal mines uh, were opened or existing were extended um, in Kazakhstan, for instance. So in 1950s, 60s, the country witnessed further uh, industrialization urbanization and uh, uh, as a, one of those 15 republics it became a separate uh, independent nation state that's the last 100 or 150 years of Kazakhstan in in a in a short you know in a summary so Haran 
Yes. Can we, uh, could you perhaps tell us then a little bit about how Russia's relationship has evolved in the post-Soviet era? Kazakhstan is uh, now an independent state. How has Russia's relationship between being uh, with Kazakhstan, has it been uh, close? Has Kazakhstan uh, built relations with the West or China? What has been the foreign policy orientation of independent Kazakhstan? And how how is it being governed and who's governing it? Um, yeah, yeah, the uh, foreign policy, actually Kazakh foreign policy, uh, to my mind, was a very... Um, they tried to keep a balance um, um, between uh, Russia and the West and later on um, with China as well, uh, because uh, Russia is a, a historically um, a big neighbor, a power neighbor. Um, I mean, there are thousands of kilometers of land border uh, they have with Russia, like uh, very similar to uh, American-Canadian border. You see, it's a very long border, um, and um, and there were, there, I mean, there are natural, uh, let's say, cultural ties as well, uh, because um, at the time of uh, independence, uh, nearly uh, half of the population was uh, Russian or Slavic, let's say, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, uh, if you take them as a overall Slavic population, um, and. Um, excessive majority also uh, spoke Russian uh, and still uh, we can say so. I mean, the Russian language um, is the language of urban, uh, urban uh, educated uh, population. Um, uh, it's the language of, uh, uh, of, it's the language to reach to, you know, it's, a, it's not only about uh, just a language, but like thanks to Russian, you can reach to bigger cultural um, um, cultural dimensions, let's say, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> language um, perceived and in practice uh, very much so um, as the language of um, uh, nomadic shepherd or a villager, a peasant, you see. Um, so uh, that's why literature is mostly in Russian. Uh, um, and um, his culture is produced in the Russian language. Although that, this doesn't mean that Russian speaker Kazakhs are not Kazakh patriots, let's say, right? Let's put it in that way. Like uh, uh, it's just their native tongue is Russian. Um, so uh, that's why what I want to say is there are strong cultural relations um, and the country was part of uh, Soviet Union and before that Russian Empire in, in overall, in total, like 200 years, there's some, uh, uh, they were part of a political unity uh, and there was economic relations, strong economic relations as well. Mm. So, um, I mean, Kazakh economy, um, uh, Russian economy, Russian and Kazakhs were also, um, Russia was a big trade partner. So that was the starting point in 1991. And then the Western uh, capital came, Western investment, Western oil and gas companies, big oil and gas companies that you know very well. Uh, when they arrived, um, the new Russian, uh, sorry, Kazakh administration, Rus uh, Kazakh government, uh, actually ex-communist uh, senior leadership in Kazakhstan who turned to be uh, the leadership of the new nation state. Um, they reframed themselves. Um, and they, they um, co 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 cooperated with the, uh, the Western uh, big uh, corporations from the West, um, Western big corporations, uh, big Western corporations, and they, they worked together. So uh, on the one hand, they had uh, a strong, uh, powerful neighbor, Russia, historical neighbor, um, uh, with historical ties. On the other hand, they, they were uh, Western investors uh, with new technology, uh, capital, in, and Kazakhstan needed that capital. Otherwise, you know, oil and gas uh, stays in the depths of the Caspian Sea. <laughs> you, you cannot uh, you cannot pump it out by using a you know uh, a small 
pipe or uh, and siphon it's what you're saying like they do here yeah, wow. siphon, yeah exactly <laughs> siphon it. Okay. so uh so you need you need technology for that um so there was that cooperation and um there were um, um very uh, open market like uh, marketization of all uh, sectors of the uh, economy uh, very radical reforms uh, as it's called neoliberal uh, reforms Everything was privatized. Um, uh, they sold the um, uh, factories. If they couldn't sell, they closed it. There was a big, uh, also unemployment as a consequence. Um, 1990s, of course, was a dramatic period for all ex-Soviet uh, um, uh, territories. Uh, very, very difficult times, um, including Kazakhstan. And of course, we have rising China. So um, again, another uh, now a powerful uh, uh neighbor uh huge economy first of all uh you know chinese economy compared to uh central asian economies including kazakhstan uh, i always uh, like to think uh, uh like to s see it like um uh united states in 1950s next to uh latin american countries you see what i mean like a, a huge economy i mean unbelievably huge incredible it's difficult to imagine that 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 size and then next to that there's a small country cultivating bananas you know um in central asian case it might not be bananas it might be cotton it might be oil gas uh, raw materials minerals uh, gold copper coal um so yeah, so um, they try to um, kind of balance uh, these three different um, um, forces of um, for yeah, uh, Western companies, corporations, and Western governments, Russia, China. That was the case, and, and still, if that is the case, actually, nothing has to, changed. I wanted to ask you a question, Harun. Uh, inter internally, in terms of the uh, Kazakh population what percentage of the population still has some sympathetic or uh, orientation towards Russia? And what percentage is more interested in perhaps pivoting towards NATO or reaching out to the West? Is there any kind of, is it a similar situation to the Ukraine where we have a kind of ideological balkanization of population in terms of where they want to orient themselves in terms of a metropole? Do they want to have a Moscow as a metropole, or do they want to have a you know you know a city in Germany or the, the capital of the EU as a metropole? Mm. Um, that's a, a good question, actually. I I would say a Kazakh case is different than the Ukrainian one. Um, um, I mean, the history is different, um, uh, economy is different. Um, there are so many differences. Uh, it's it's not it's not a para, it's not parallel um and um and um i mean western culture uh, is of course uh um very prominent in kazakhstan as everywhere else you, wherever you go in the world uh, i assume like from i don't know from madagascar to uh paraguay i mean you you will always find uh products of western culture uh that's uh unescapable uh, there's no alternative um so that's i would say and this is the case also in the in uh, in kazakhstan um but like um um i would say in uh, more urban uh, russian-speaking uh, kazakhs uh, would prefer to keep a balance between uh, different, um, different, um, uh, let's say, uh, different powers, um, um, and uh, that that probably they would see, um, uh, they would see that they would see it a more um, uh, a better scenario for for Russia. Uh, sorry, for Kazakhstan. Um, I mean, there are a lot of Kazakhs living in Kazakhs uh, in Russia as well, working there, um, 
they uh, not only like a cheap um, um, uh, on, uh, um, cheap labor, like um, un uneducated cheap labor. No, there are, there are a lot of middle class uh, Kazakhs uh, working in uh, Russian banks, uh, IT people uh, working in Moscow um, because they they couldn't find uh, they couldn't build uh, the career for instance uh, they couldn't climb up the career ladder for various reasons in Kazakhstan and Moscow uh, promises um, more opportunities uh, to them uh, Russian market that's why there is also um, there's a mi uh, labor migration from Kazakhstan to uh, Russia. So there are family links, uh, you see, um, part of the family living in Russia, part of it uh, living in uh, Kazakhstan. And people, you know, in their ordinary lives, they don't usually take these things. Uh, their, their lives are not uh, shaped by some geopolitical imaginations. Uh, people live their ordinary lives, their normal lives. And, uh, you know, um, someone wants to find a job here someone wants to uh, marry there uh, and have children you know the, the ordinary um, um priorities of life uh, uh i would say uh, dictates like uh, not not the ge geopolitical um uh, people don't think about these in their and daily lives that much i guess Arun, on, on, on that note, like there's uh, some people in the American left that uh, have argued that protests against the Kazakh government um, in terms of like a color, color revolution and like a U.S. backed plot to decentralize or destabilize Central Asia. Um, and how do you see that interpretation, you know, especially versus off of like people could just be arguing against, you know, <laughs> their own material conditions not being met? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't agree with them. Uh, there are claims that it was a, a Western conspiracy, colored revolution. You know, um, and there are even there are also, uh, uh, believe it or not, but there are also claims that it was uh, the whole thing was uh, planned in Moscow. Uh, uh, that was a, a, I mean, that was a Russian conspiracy. Uh, I see neither of them in Kazakhstan. Do, do you see Moscow wanting to have a? A certain return to uh, Soviet era hegemony, though, with Putin in charge. Um, I now, apart from the recent events uh, in Kazakhstan, um, uh, in general, uh, there is a Russian perception of security, um, and that is about uh, having buffer zones around Russia because Russia is a land uh, uh, land it was a land empire and it is a huge chunk of big chunk of land in the middle of Eurasian continent right that's why uh, for them like it is for the British to have a strong navy in the 19th century for them uh, the threat comes from land uh, historically, for last 300 years, uh, there were three times when a strong European army marched towards Russia. First was the Polish army, and then the uh, French army, and then the German army. You forgot uh, the Swedish. Swedish, uh, Swedish. They already were already in Baltic. <clears throat> they Russians actually pushed them uh, out of um, uh, the Baltics. Um, uh but the so there's a there's a perception of threat and there's a for them the solution is to have uh buffer zones uh but what happened in kazakhstan uh i think is not about big geopolitics or big politics you know uh big people playing uh big games um i think it was uh there were I don't see any conspiracies there, Western conspiracy or Russian conspiracy in Kazakhstan. That's my personal uh, view. I can go into details if you like, but there just just one one sentence I want to uh, uh, add before I stop. Um, in 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 short, in short, in two sentences, the the, the protests uh, started in the, on the second of January, 
um, when ordinary people went out to streets to protest, um, uh, the protest was uh, against a rise in price of li uh, LGP uh, liquidified gas uh, prices. It was ra raised 100% from 60 tenge to 120 tenge per liter. And you cannot explain to people in a country where uh, oil and gas is abundant as water. You know, uh, to uh, you cannot say that the uh, oh sorry the global uh, energy uh, prices are rising. That's why you have to pay the same price. No, How long nobody will buy that. But the then, I'm sorry. but then after this first stage where there were peaceful protesters, they those economic demands. I can go into detail uh, the the social economic background of that. Um, Later on, at the second stage, there was a second stage, as it always happens in these uh, protests. They, um, there was a power struggle um, among the political elites in Kazakhstan. So, uh, in a way, uh, one branch of the political elite tried to eliminate the other branch by hijacking these protests of ordinary people on the street. Uh, there, the, uh, in order to one part eliminate the other, they also ask Moscow's assistance. Uh, so in a way, uh, this also reminds me um, uh, night 18, uh, 1848 uh, eight revolutions in, in, in Europe, um, uh, because um, uh, some, somehow I find some uh, resemblance there, uh, 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 a similar picture. At that time, um, nationalism was the ideology of liberation, emancipation, and uh, nationalism promised everyone uh, that ordinary people would be free and emancipated uh, from the feudal um, uh, limitations, uh, you know, um, regulations, and um, people are prized um, because of this promise, like Hungarians in Austro-Hungarian Empire, for instance, Austrian Empire, at that time it was in Austria, Austria Austrian Empire, uh, Hungarian uh, nations led by ideologies and um, activists of that time, and um, Austrian Empire, Austrian army uh, could not uh, deal with this uh, because that, it was not the only Hungarians, <laughs> but also Czechs were uprising. You know, um, uh, there were other nationalities were also, uh, um, um, they also start to fight against the regime, against the existing uh, political elite and political systems. Um, and the Austrian em emperor um, asked uh, Russian, for Russian help. Uh, and the Russian Tsar uh, sent a huge army. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, like 150,000 uh, soldiers. Um, and that was the equal to the whole <laughs> uprising uh, people, you know, like it's uh, their forces. So um, the Russian army crashed the um, Hungarian uprising and uh, helped uh, Austrian monarchy Austrian uh, monarchy, uh, uh, Habsburg monarchy, to rule uh, nearly another century until the First World War, in a way. Um, thanks to that intervention, um, restoration of the order or uh, protecting the status quo, um, um, they, um, the Habsburg monarchy continued. And that's why, hence, of course, after that, um, Russian Tsar, uh, Tsarism, Russian Empire um, had this label, um, uh, you know, the policeman of Europe, gendarme of Europe, uh, keeping the status quo, um, uh, suppressing any revolutionary uh, activities. So um, what happened in a way, um, 
in Kazakhstan, everything started with the ordinary people going out protesting against economic conditions, um, lack of justice in the country, corruption, and so on, which turned into a bit more to a political uh, demands as well. Uh, some protesters wanted more freedoms, rights, and return to a, a, a more democratic constitution in the country. At that moment, there was a political struggle. I can go into detail. Um, among the elites, uh, one party wanted to eliminate the other. Um, they used this, in a way, hijacked these uh, demonstrations. I suspect some of them, some uh, provocateurs also uh, appeared among the demonstrations um, in order to uh, justify uh, subscription or, you know, the reaction of the regime further down the road, um, uh, you know, shooting guns and so on, um, burning some buildings, because the initial protesters were very organized, orderly and peaceful. Um, and uh, last stage is uh, the, the group that wanted to eliminate uh, the other group um, called Moscow and said, uh, guys, do you want uh, turmoil and uh, chaos uh, uh, beyond your southern borders? If you want uh, the status quo to remain, you need to help me. Okay. So, uh, because uh, there could be, because the, uh, the president could not trust if his military intelligence organization and the police was 100% loyal to him uh, or if there could be another, you know, palace coup uh, intrigues might be going on. So he wanted to have uh, an external force to re um, reestablish uh, the order. Uh, that's what happened. So in a way, who used who is a big question. Uh, there is a there is a Russian saying, uh, uh, like uh, who uses whom. Uh, uh, was it the Moscow using someone in the Kazakhstan or actually a part of the Kazakh elites were using uh, Moscow in order to consolidate their position and eliminate the other group? Uh, that's a big question. Uh, but I don't see any conspiracy in advance like now we will organize this uh, group. They will, be go they will go out on the streets, shout, and then we will send these guys and then you know things will turn into like the country go into kind of a chaos uh, and then we will intervene hijack the, no no I, I, that that also diminished the role of local agents nearly to zero uh, you know uh, local economic conditions social conditions local power struggle uh um people's sufferings um, um uh, you know um they all uh considered as they do not exist <laughs> i mean when you go down the road with that uh conspiracy theories uh that there wasn't any i wanted to ask you a, a follow-up question if you will harun you make a very very uh, important point in that you know, the the desire of many people on the left to assume that any time there is an opposition uprising mm -hmm. in a country that or f against a country that is considered to be a counter hegemon in the United States, that is almost always assumed that it's a CIA sponsored or NED National Endowment for Democracy sponsored color revolution. I remember vividly when the situation arose in Sudan. A lot of people were saying that the forces that took out the Bashir administration in Sudan were a color a color revolution. But when you talk about the protests in, in the Kazakh region and you talk about political economy, there's one thing that I have not heard anyone really considered and uh, I've heard very scant discourse about. What about the role of COVID in causing the economic precarity that might be causing the destabilization it's facing uh, uh, the, the, the Kazakhs, particularly because we do know that the Russians are not doing very well in their management of COVID at all. And how are the other areas and regions doing so also? And is that playing a factor in causing the discontent with the factions in the country? 
That's a, that's a, uh, you, you made two points uh, and they're both important. First of all, yes, of course, we know historical examples of those kind of uh, interventions, intrigues. Um, I mean, uh, the American uh, agencies, security agencies, uh, intelligence agencies, uh, they are capable of and uh, they demonstrated <laughs> their capacity uh, um, um, of doing such things uh, for 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 the whole 20th century, uh, I mean, from from Nicaragua to Iran, uh, from Guatemala to um, uh, uh, Congo, uh, um, you know, uh, Indonesia. Uh, I mean, there, there are countless examples. Uh, you know better than me, uh, and um, I, as a person who is aware of this. Uh, I'm, I consciously say that I don't think that this was the case. Uh, but then again, sometimes certain things happen because of the local conditions and external players can hijack. Uh, you know, they, they can manipulate an ongoing process um, um, uh, towards their own uh, uh, goals, uh, 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 so to, towards a point that they wanted to, they wanted to to, to bring. You know, they uh, they they can manipulate the local actors, local um, uh, currents, uh, in order to bring that country from A to B. Uh, although, if they haven't intervened, perhaps uh, things would develop in an in a different. Uh, way of course um so uh but in the kazakh case um there's one big reason why i don't see a, a reason um there's a, a, for either russian conspiracy or western conspiracy because in kazakhstan there is no one no one uh uh gains anything extra by uh changing the status quo right mm -hmm. Uh, this is a country, uh, a very rich, min mineral rich country. I mean, like uh, gold, oil, uh, gas, coal, copper, everything you want, you have it. Uh, it's the size of Western Europe, around 20 million lives. Um, it's like, you know, um, uh, yeah. So, um, and the market is open to uh, Western corporations. Uh, they heavily invested in uh, the Caspian, the Caspian Sea shore, uh, uh, because the Soviets exploited the Soviets. Uh, of course, invested in oil and gas industry in Kazakhstan, uh, northwest, north, northwest Kazakhstan, the Caspian uh, Sea. Uh, um, uh, there were oil wells, uh, etc. But the uh, Soviet technology. Uh, was not uh, 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 developed enough to exploit offshore uh, deposits. They could only exploit the land deposit that uh, in the land or, or very close to the shoreline. So what uh, American, um, British, Italian um, uh, corporations, big oil and gas corporations, brought was this new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing happened in Azerbaijan as well in the Caucasus. So, um, so that's why they actually have something to lose if the status quo changes. And because uh, once things start to change in political sphere, they might be economic consequence, uh, consequences yeah. in the economic sphere. You don't know where exactly things can uh, and Look, let me, sorry, sorry to interrupt you uh, real quick, but I think this is a, is a really important point that you're touching on because so often what you hear kind of regurgitated, especially in these media circles, is that uh, it has to be some sort of U.S. influence. And what you're saying is that the United States corporations and many corporations in the West have a vested financial interest to keep the status quo. Jean, would you like to expand on this on this notion as well? Because I know you speak out about it very eloquently. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would agree with Harun. I mean, of course, 
uh, there are places where we see American influence, and I and I agree. You have cases where you have an indigenous revolution, and of course, external actors attempt to shape and uh, control that revolution. Syria being probably the best example of re recent years, where you have an uprising against uh, the Ba'athist regime, largely because of a local set of conditions, but then everybody and their mother, including the CIA, gets involved and prolongs the, the conflict. Now, I would say, it, it, I, I would agree, Harun knows a lot more about this than me, but I don't, you know, I don't see uh, uh, American corporations, and let's remember, you know, the Kazakh government was being advised by Tony Blair. You know, <laughs> there, were, there, there were huge, investments yeah. into the into Kazakhstan from Western industry industry if we uh, you know there may be strategic reasons why one would uh, as the United States would want to destabilize Central Asia whether it's Belt and Road or to annoy the Russians but if we agree that corporations are powerful in the United States there's also big countervailing forces in uh, to maintain the uh the the status quo because kazakhstan has uh the kazakh elite may be corrupt they may be venal but they've played this balancing act and if you take kazakh oil and gas off the global market that's going to be uh, that's going to be a big catastrophic a, 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 it's going to be catastrophic for a lot of, oh, lot of different Gene, you you've said this before that american exceptionalism also works in this context as well the idea that no country can do anything on their own. It always has to be the influence of America. Well, I think there are, there are places where America has more institutional experience and has a longer tradition of the Americas. Of, of the Americas, like not you know, like Latin America, the Caribbean. We see very clearly that the United States has like a very There's strong a playbook. playbook, institutional memory. But Kazakhstan, do they have the compared to the influence that the Russians can exercise? I'm not sure that the United States has even the, you know, like has the capacity to shape events in Central Asia the same way that it does in, let's say, Latin America or the con uh, or, or the uh, African continent and places like that. This place was locked up uh, behind the Iron Curtain until, you know, a generation ago. So we're dealing with, you know, I, I, I'm just very suspect about. You know, they're just most of the world is American playground, but there are some parts of the world, especially as we see the emergence of a more multipolar geopolitical situation. There are some parts of the world where the Americans are not the top dog. They're not even the second dog, because if we're looking at Central Asia, the Chinese factor has to ha has to uh, uh, drop in as well. And, you know, I think the Chinese, they're quite happy for the Russians to go in there and, and play the role of policemen because the Chinese are generally conservative with their uh, foreign policy. And uh, so long as it's stable and so long as there's someone there who can keep things in order, they're happy to go along with it. What will be interesting is whether in the long term, mm -hmm. Russia and China don't come to blows over Central Asia, but that's you know probably way down the line. Now, Pascal has a question just, about... I want to interject about a couple of things. One, I still want to know if that... And if it's totally not a factor, just let me know if COVID was a factor at all whatsoever in terms of ah, the, yes, the you, 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 exactly. You are right. Um, I think that was I I suspect that was part of it. I mean, this discontent. Uh, if I give you some uh, details about the um, um, economic conditions or social conditions, for instance, uh, prior to the riots, um, prior to the protests, that might fill some gaps because. Um, we, we we usually react to things. Some, we sometimes react like this. Like we suddenly see headlines like, oh, there are riots, uh, uh, some protests in Kazakhstan and the police is shooting and the people are behind the barricades. What's going on there? Is there a conspiracy behind it? But if you don't know the economic conditions, um, um, uh, what the, 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 the life of the ordinary people on in the ground, you know, grassroots feelings, um, um, uh, then, then everything is up in the air, and those sometimes those gaps can be filled by uh, some conspiracies. Uh, this is again, I do not deny that. Uh, of course, uh, um, there, uh, as also Gini said, like uh, as in the Syrian civil war, uh, external actors uh, very often intervene if they find. 
some if they find an opportunity um, to achieve certain uh, political uh, foreign policy goals, you know, um, uh, to to execute their own agendas. Um, but here, for instance, in um, the uh, the the protests. Um, uh, this is not the first protest in Kazakhstan, actually. Um, um, before, um, there were a couple of years back, there were protests um, in the oil and gas uh, region uh, in Janos. And, um, and there are strong uh, labor unions there um, because um, oil and gas industry is the main remaining big industrial branch of the economy where uh, people experience this usual um, um, production relations you see uh, between let's say uh, between capital and labor if we put it in uh, probably marxist terms so um, first mass protests uh, broke out after the new year holidays uh, for this the initial reason was the rise of this price of uh, gas for cars uh, because uh, because of um, expensive oil, uh, many drivers, including cab drivers, switch to liquidified gas from um, uh, oil. You see, uh, as a fuel. Um, so, and when the when the price went up from sixty to one hundred twenty tenge uh, per liter, uh, that was that was oh, that was of course awful for all these um, drivers and their household. Um, and it started in west of Kazakhstan in uh, Mangistau region, uh, as I said, in the heartland of large oil uh, production enterprises, uh, because uh, this is where uh, protests happened um, a couple of years ago, um, where uh, even the protesters occupied the local administration center and police shot strikers, uh, 15 strikers, and. Uh, injured a uh, couple of hundreds um, and the administration was um, uh, I mean they experienced some uh, difficult days uh, uh, back in the, in those days um, they, they were afraid that this could spread to whole country um, anyway going back to the uh, 2nd of January then the uh, the protests also spread to other cities to Almaty to uh, um, to the ex capital economic center of the country and then to the political center to the capital um, um, of the country and then the protesters clash with police but the um, and the uh, the Kazakh Kazakh authorities tried to first explain that the gas prices increased. Uh, because the price is now determined by electronic bidding. This is what market has decided. You know, we are we have a free market economy. We have nothing to do with this. But then in a country where there are a lot of gas and oil, and uh, when people also experience uh, corruption and injustices in their daily lives, if this is part of their daily lives, uh of course they will not they didn't buy this argument you know uh you cannot convince people uh with this argument so what happened is as a precaution is that the, the government stepped back they lowered the gas prices and um, uh, it's a presidential system the cabinet uh, resigned or dismissed um but then the protesters continued um, their activities and um but this is this this is this is like a tipping point. This is like a, where the this like a boiling point. You see, this is like a threshold because there have been social problems accumulating for years, uh, and COVID as well. The COVID pandemic and the um, deteriorating economic conditions because of COVID also, uh, uh, I think, was an important factor here. So uh, and also the rising gas prices was a consequence of COVID. Uh, uh, so they are all interconnected. Um, but there was a discontent before this. Um, but probably things reached to a boiling point uh, with COVID and uh, um, unemployment and gas prices, uh, rising gas prices, you see. So um, this, uh, I mean, the, the, there is this um, 
Um, um, the, the, as I said, there's, the economy is very much uh, dependent on oil and gas uh, production, oil and gas export as well. And um, and there's the, they they have uh, the companies that are experiencing probably much more freedom than uh, their let's say branches uh, in in a Western country, in Western Europe. Um, the labor unions are weak um traditionally uh thanks to the soviet legacy actually um and um jobs were recently jobs were cut uh because the uh, oil and gas uh, industry went to um, a large scale optimization and jobs were cut workers began to lose their salaries uh, and uh, for instance tengiz oil uh, as far as i know uh, fired 40,000 workers um, uh, at once. Um, and it became a, risk, a big shock uh, in that region, Western Kazakhstan, you know, because one oil worker actually feeds five to 10 family members. These are, they have big families. So, um, so a dismissal or a firing of a, a, of a worker automatically condemns the whole family, whole uh, to, to starvation. Um, so, Harun, I just want Pascal has one more question before we get to the Ukraine. So, uh, Pascal, do you want to hit up that final question and then we pivot to the Ukraine? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Gene. One of the things, uh, unfortunately, in the consciousness of most Americans in the West is that when you say Islam and Muslims, they think Arab, Middle East, and they don't realize that the largest population of Muslims we have is actually in Malaysia. But there's a large Muslim population around the region in the former Soviet Union. And we also know that there are a large number of Muslims in Kazakhstan. Is there an Islamist element in Kazakhstan at all? I've always been curious about this because we know that when the Chechnyans were going through their separatist phase, the Russians used that as a pretext to claim that there was almost a kind of like Islamist, quote unquote, Al Qaeda like movement in Chechnya to punish them. Does anything similar to that exist in Kazakhstan or do they have a more kind of mild type? Um, uh, moderate type of Islam in that particular country. Yeah, someone was correct. It's Indonesia, not Malaysia, in terms of the majority Muslim country. I see. I'm sorry. Uh, Kazakhs, because they have uh, no, no. Uh, sh uh, short answer is no. Um, uh, during these uh, protests, perhaps 10, 15 radical militants, sleeping cells activated and they thought that's the opportunity now there is no police on the streets there are protesters everywhere there's a chaotic um, uh, situation uh, let's go and uh, burn the uh, town uh, administrative center government's uh, uh, office at the town center in a in a in a town and it's uh, it's claimed that in one of the towns this happened um and they, they just, in an opportunistic way, you know, they, they thought perhaps, uh, but this is like 15 uh, militants going out and using this lawlessness uh, a gap of uh, uh, absence of power, absence of rule on the streets and just uh, doing what they were dreaming about for a, for a long time and finding this as a, uh, seeing this as an opportunity. I mean, they're not, they were not alone alone because there were apparently there were some mafia groups uh, ransack some um, uh, gun shops uh, for the future you know to <laughs> to refresh their uh, uh, gun stocks you know rifles and uh, uh, bullets and so on so um, when there's uh, there's no law on this in the streets there's no uh, order uh, you can find all kind of people but uh, there's no big um, radical islamic movement in kazakhstan uh, there has never been uh, the problem is uh, this discontent economic uh, problems uh, big uh, gap uh, poor and rich um, hundreds of thousands or millions moving from the villages to cities living in shanty towns uh, south, uh, around the uh, you know the poor districts uh, emerging like mushrooms after rain uh, you know, they they, uh, they they do not have access to the wealth. Uh, wealth distribution is uh, really bad. Uh, you know, uh, a very small elite he, uh, he, uh, enjoys creme de la creme. You know, they enjoys the uh, cream of uh, this uh, big um, 
um, natural de exploitation of uh, big deposits, um, uh, nat um, 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 oil, gas, and so on, uh, with their with foreign uh, corporations, and uh, as, uh, the ex huge majority majority, um, they cannot have access to normal health services, education. If their sons and daughters, if they want to find a job, proper job, they need to know someone within the system. Otherwise, uh, skills and merits do not count uh, at all. Wow. Um, uh, if you are rich, you can hit uh, with your car someone and kill someone uh, by accident, uh, and you can get away with it. But if you are poor, you might end up in jail easily. Nobody will defend you. You know, all kind of injustice, discontent. Of it sounds course, like purge. Hmm? the purge. The purge. Sounds like the purge is going on over there. Some, some, uh, all these things, of course, feeds the uh, uh, all kind of ideologies and uh, Islamic ex extremism mm -hmm. uh, benefits from this, uh, this these conditions. You see, uh, some people, of course, think that um, uh, seeing this picture, uh, like uh, probably the salvation is in religion. Uh, and if people of the book, if people who are really pious, you know, b believers, if they come to power, uh, they will bring justice, they will bring order, and everyone will uh, be free and have bread on their table. So that's, of course, that's, that's, that's not good. Uh, uh, this uh, discontent generates conservatism and, in some cases, fanaticism. Um, Islam becomes the ideology of discontent, of newly urban ex-villagers. And then before uh, we, we, we uh, pivot, uh, just one sentence probably becomes a, a, a ideology of um, uh, in in, uh, in Marxist terminology probably they become a, they, Islam becomes a um, ideology of uh, um, 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 not petit bourgeois the um, um, <laughs> the the other term um, the, proletariat uh, exactly uh, exactly. Um, so, and that's a false uh, call for um, uh, emancipation and false, false, false uh, address to solve the issues, economic issues, social and economic issues in the country. But that's the way. It, that's the that's the you know, that's the reality. And, and before we pivot to some questions about the current situation in the Ukraine, um, as our wonderful moderators, what they do is they look you up and then they put links to you in the in the chat so people can buy your book follow you on social media there is apparently another harun yilmaz that is a weightlifter are you aware of this person or is that what you did in a former life what's going on here harun yeah can you actually stand up prove you're not just jacked that's that's a that's a, that's a Russian conspiracy, you know. Uh, they planted <laughs> yeah. that guy <laughs> to discredit my image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know anything. This guy's just a meathead. <laughs> yeah. Some someone said, uh, I, "I don't know which one is which, but uh, if, if this is the weightlifter, he's smart as fuck." <laughs> <laughs> it's all the steroids. <laughs> yeah. um, Brain steroids. <laughs> But uh, no, and, and and to like shifting uh, to Ukraine, um, if you could, and you know, going through another like um, a few hundred years and a few minutes of history, uh, what you know, some of the relationship with uh, Ukraine and and uh, Russia, especially some of these uh, contested regions, and like not that like they're you know contested over regions, I should say. Um, and uh also and what i'm curious about is like any of your thoughts as far as uh that balancing act between you know russian and western hegemony and and um and also with also getting the new uh president who is you know was a comedian there was a lot of fanfare but is his i guess not uh ex like lack of experience in these type of like large geopolitical um you know issues did that lead to this kind of like moment where, you know, they start, the, you know, like Russia and, you know, the U.S. start 
pushing a little bit more. Um, so, so you don't think a comedian as president is a good idea, President Fozzie Bear? Uh, I mean, <laughs> what's going on with the economy? Hey, whoa, I'm just whoa, asking whoa. questions. I'm just asking. The, I'm just asking questions. <laughs> You know, I think Zelensky, the president, uh, current president of Ukraine, uh, is a very uh, competent, competent person, competent man, uh, very intelligent, very, uh, uh, I think he knows, uh, he can, he, he, he can surpass, uh, I can assure you, many American politicians, he knows well what he's doing, he's, he's, his background might be uh, co uh, being a comedian, uh, but he's doing really well. Uh, he, I think he, uh, I'm, I'm very much impressed by, um, especially by his recent um, uh, speeches and um, uh, comments uh, on uh, what's going on uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, or let's let's say um, um, uh, how he sees his country within. A bigger picture, uh, uh, so uh, I think I think he's a very um, he's a um, he, he's he's doing much better than people expected. Uh, 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 I don't see a reason to ridicule him. Um, he's doing well um, now. About um, uh, well, someone wrote Zelensky probably more qualified than Biden. I nearly I would agree with that. You know, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to give any concrete names, but uh, uh, he's a very clever guy. He's a very clever guy, young, energetic, and clever guy. I would say. Uh, but this doesn't mean that I endorse everything he does and everything he will do in the next five years. You know, just One for the moment. Was like, I want like, to put it. Uh, do you think that him, like even like with his past and just being a new president, that 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 played a role in some of the you know moves and different engagements that have been happening recently. No, I think I think if if uh, anything if the if his past played a role, I guess it was a positive one because uh, the comedy show he had before being a president. Uh, in that comedy show, he was also a president, so uh, he was in a way uh, you know. Um, um, warming up for the for the role, uh, if you look at it res retrospectively, uh, uh, probably that show uh, helped him a lot. There was a famous political uh, comedy in in, uh, in Britain. Um, I don't know if you ever watched the Yes Minister and the Yes Prime Minister. I think uh, the script writers uh, were brilliant. Um, and if I played. I, if I, I think like the, the actors who played in uh, those yes ministers um, uh, probably would be also good ministers if they if they start to be really active in politics, you know. Um, I, go, go ahead. But, but going back to Ukraine uh, and Russia, um, I don't see, you know, the, the first of all, let me start uh, with the most important uh, aspect of this uh, crisis. Uh, the biggest question is, uh, the most important uh, question is, if there is going to be a war uh, in Ukraine and if Russia will occupy uh, big chunks or big parts of, you know, uh, 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 half of Ukraine, according to those scenarios and maps you can see on uh, mainstream media. Uh, uh, my answer is no. Uh, and I have a... Uh, I can explain you why uh, there won't be a war unless there will unless an uncontrolled um, uh, you know uh, an, um, a, a fraction uh, within a, an intelligence service or a military uh, provokes something. I don't think that um, uh, Moscow plans to occupy Ukraine. They don't need to occupy Ukraine, and um, they don't. Uh, this is not the. How, this is not how Moscow uh, 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 uses um, hard power or uh, military power um, in foreign policy. They have oh. a different way of doing it. Uh, full scale of war do do, is something Russia avoids. 
constantly avoid and it will avoid in Ukraine as well. I, I do I have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. to, sorry to interrupt, and it is to, to what you're talking about. Do you think Putin is a master strategist when it comes to things like this, or do you think this is going to blow up in his face? I think he's a master of leverage. Uh, he can uh, move uh, like David and David and Goliath. You know, he can. Uh, uh, he waits for the right moment, and uh, he has only. He knows that he has only one bullet. And he fires that bullet, and uh, usually he shoots well, uh, like a sniper. Uh, why I'm saying he has only one bullet? Because the Russian, uh, the American budget, the main adversary or rival, let's say, at global scale uh, uh, in geopolitical uh, terms, the American budget is 11 times more than the Russian uh, defense budget, Pentagon's budget is 11 times, 11 times more than the Russian defense budget. That's a fact. And the strategists in Moscow uh, know this fact very well. When they plan something, uh, they, uh, I think they remember this fact every day, 20, 24, 24 hours of the, you know, uh, 30 days of a month. They know that their military budget, defense budget, is 11 times smaller than the American defense budget. It's not only about, uh, uh, it's not about dollar, dollar comparison. It's not about like um, um, uh, quantitative uh, 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 comparison. In qualitative uh, sense that, uh, um, in qualitative comparison also, American army, uh, is the strongest army in human history. I mean, uh, uh, you might ask me, oh, why they were defeated here and there? That's another question. But uh, as a force that you can YouTube, you can mobilize, this is a huge, huge power, a huge, huge uncomparable. Uh, so, uh, as you know, the, the next, 12 countries, actually, uh, Russia, China, Britain, France, next biggest um, defense budgets in the world, next 12 defense budgets in the world, um, Russia, China, France, uh, Germany, Iran, Israel, when you add them up together, uh, it equals to the American uh, Pentagon uh, defense budget. So, um, and the technology, Pentagon uh, has is, uh, is 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 top technology. I mean, they, 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 uh, you know, they 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 invest uh, billions of dollars in te technological uh, de in, uh, development um, in in military. So, um, and Russians know this, uh, and that's why they have to be master of leverage. They have to use. A small amount of power in order to gain two, three times more. There's this cost effective approach they have. Uh, they have in Africa, they have in the Middle East, they have in. Uh, uh, Harun. Yeah. I wanted to interject. You said something that I think uh, I got I to counter in terms of the United States, you know, large and very extensive military budget and the size of the U.S. military and their military prowess that that completely humiliated in Afghanistan less than six months ago. The United States muscle and military power does not stop the fact that there are certain times in which its capacity to have a military or armed services has been totally ineffectual in getting powers that are with less money or smaller or in certain geo geopolitical locations to be absolutely devastated. The United States has been quagmired in the Middle East for years. In, 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 I completely in, agree with you. I completely agree with you. Uh, it, uh, it, it, there are also historical examples, Vietnam, for instance, right? Uh, but the, uh, that's, that's, I completely agree with you. But, um, but uh, for a strategist, uh, uh, if you are sitting in Moscow, uh, you have to acknowledge uh, or take into consideration uh, uh, the 
the immense uh, uh, you know power <laughs> uh, um, you cannot you, ca it, you cannot leave it to chances like um, they can they they failed here and they might fail there as well kind of uh, you have to make your calculations accordingly yeah, um, but Harold, as, as a reality as a fact in okay. general all things you just said in terms of how the United States has all of this military technology more budget the Soviet Union has over 1,000 more nuclear warheads than the United States. That's a fact. So in terms of actually global, geostrategic, destructive capacity with the most dangerous weapons in the world, the, the, Soviet, the Russian, the former Soviet Union, the Russians, eclipsed the U.S. Is that, well, I, I, the only pushback well, on that is that when it comes to nuclear arms that are online. No, that's weapons, that warheads. Yeah, online. Yes. Like, right. you to, like, 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 like you push a button right now and it fires versus how much you're stockpiled, you know? And, like, I know this is semantics and everything like that. But, like, it gets to the point where it's, like, you could destroy the world three, four times over with each stockpile that any country has. You know, and the thing is, like, where I agree with Haroon is that the capacity for destruction is there. The capacity for complete annihilation for, you know, the United States military to just roll through and kill everyone is there. How it's utilized, you know, that's a whole different story. But well, there's also another fact that's what, what type of war are we talking about? Yeah, exactly. When, when we look the, at, G, G makes a very good point because, when we, they, listen, in the age of drone and technological warfare, you can have a war with a country and never send your military. I mean, this is, um, this is, the, this is the concrete point, I would say. Look at the Iraq war. The Iraqi state army, the, the army of the Iraqi state was crushed in a couple of weeks, right? But that wasn't what defeated the Americans in Iraq, just as it wasn't, you know. So Russia obviously is going to look at planning wars on a state-to-state -state level, on a, on a state-to-state -state conflict level, in which case that's a very different equation from whether you're a guerrilla army who uh, who is doing a totally different type of war? So I see what I see what your point is, uh, Pascal. That you know the the United States military is not an omnipotent force, but at the same time, I see what Harun's saying is if you're a state planner and you're planning for state to state conflict, like these type of conflicts that don't happen anymore, your your calculus is totally different. If you're fighting this low technology war, if you're uh, and, and increasingly we are seeing, and we saw it in the war in Azerbaijan recently. All this drone technology, all this kind of, uh, all this kind of like um, funky technology is being used, and the Americans have a lead in it. So you know, I do, I see, I, I see the, and what makes it even more dangerous, actually, is I think, and I don't know if you guys would agree with me, is that the actual number of men that the United States has to deploy to. Uh, like exercise extremely a uh, violent force is a lot lower. Like when you had to deploy thousands and thousands to Vietnam, well, you take a couple of thousand casualties, even if you're dishing them out to the uh, Vietnamese 10 times, you, the political will in the United States saps away. But when you're just talking about having dudes in California with remote control drones, droning people and all this kind of stuff, that's another, uh, I mean, like I'm not an expert on, on, on war. Well, in mil military contracting, like, like, graze that number like as far as like because you're going from vietnam to right now you're looking like two was it 50 to one service members to one, like 50 service members to one contractor at this point it's two to one in the reverse and so that obfuscates the actual number of people deployed but you are correct like as far as like the amount of people that are deploying into areas and engaging in in, in scenarios is like infinitely smaller it's just we don't hear at all about like the contractors they get fucking Schwacked and, and the Pentagon's not responsible for 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 announcing uh, that. You I, never I hear about the contractors. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, you were you about no, 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 no. We're, I was actually getting ready to pass the mic to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, one of the followers said, "Therefore, Putin picks his battles." This is probably exactly what I want to say um, in in a sentence. Um, Putin picks uh, his battles and does it very carefully. Uh, the strategists in Moscow, I'm, why I'm explaining this, this is, I want to explain, uh, first I want to explain you how uh, I, I think that they are looking at things. Uh, and then uh, to explain what's going on in Ukraine, you see, uh, what's the aim, what's the goal, and what are the means uh, for Moscow. 
um, and what's the cost effective uh, move, uh, cost effective steps uh, to achieve those goals as a strategist? Uh, um, because the because the Russians know um, the their their uh, uh, economic or military limits, uh, they have um, they have um, they first of all analyze everything well on the ground. Uh, they make a well uh, uh, make a well uh, they make a, a risk assessment. Uh, they understand what's the as, as, uh, the cost and uh, gains. Uh, and then if gains are two, three times bigger than the cost, they move on, right? Uh, um, they, they, they take the risk, they take a very calculated risk. For instance, in 2008 in Georgia, uh, the Georgian president uh, at that time, Saakashvili, uh, decided that he can um, take back the uh, separatist uh, region of South Ossetia by force. Um, and um, um, and perhaps if he succeeded there, he would go on to or to Abkhazia as well. These are two small uh, ethnic uh, separate uh, um, uh, regions in Georgia. So um, um, he ordered Georgian army enter South Ossetia, which was under the Russian protection uh, in one word, right? And uh, in uh, in after a week. Um, um, of uh, like um, battles between the Russian forces and Georgian forces, like even less than a week actually. After a few days, Russians uh, push back the Georgians, uh, Georgian forces from South Ossetia and even uh, cross the border and enter to Georgia proper um, in, in, like, uh, um, in a matter of five, six days. Um, <laughs> it's, and it's normal because it's like... Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Honduras is fighting against the uh, United States of America, right? Something like that. So um, uh, what happened is um, Russians advance into Georgia proper. Uh, they cross the uh, border, uh, unrecognized border of South Ossetia, marched uh, forward, but only 20 kilometers. Uh, they entered to the town of Gori and they stopped. Uh, if you look at the map, I don't have the map, I cannot uh, show you now, but if you look at the map, um, there, there were some military operations uh, next to the Abkhazian uh, border as well, but overall, Russians did not have an overpowering adversary military force against them. Despite that, they stopped at a certain point. They could go further occupy that bit of the of Georgia, which would literally divide the country into two separate halves and, and occupy, also control the precious um, um, oil and gas pipelines uh, from Azerbaijan to the Turkish coast in the Mediterranean. Um, and they could, they could literally uh, co um, uh, trigger the collapse of the whole economic and political system in Georgia. Because the Georgian army, that small army, uh, now after that was positioned around the capital of Tbilisi, uh, and they thought that the Russian army would march towards Tbilisi, and they were just uh, digging uh, trenches there uh, uh, around the capital. Um, but the Russian side did not do that. Uh, they didn't move forward. They stop at the 20 kilometers out of the uh, south of Ossetia uh, in, into uh, 20 kilometers in depth into the Georgia proper, and they stop. And they let the Europeans uh, come and uh, run the negotiations, mediations, and the French president came and so on. Um, and there was an agreement. And at the end, what happened is Russian forces withdrew. Um, they, they went back to south Ossetia, and they gave uh, back the, the George, uh, proper Georgian territories to the Georgian government. In, a sen in, a, in one word, they went back to the uh, status quo ante, to the, to the pre-war position of uh, They said, okay, we, we push back the Georgian forces from South Ossetia, and we go back to the uh, previous day before the conflict started. We will not gain anything. We will not lose anything. This is what we want to re-establish the existing order, right? 
um, because if they have if they have done uh, if they have gone further uh, control the gas oil pipelines divide the country into literally into two halves by occupying the middle of the country um, etc et uh, there would be much bigger consequences and costs the costs would rise beyond the gains they would have so they decided this is too costly we will not instead of gaining those things we will not uh, uh, go further in Syrian case, in Syrian civil war, when they uh, intervened in Syria, uh, Russian strategists again, of course, made a calculation. Do we need to send an army, land army, to Syria? Well, in logistic sense, it's very costly. You know, uh, sending a, an army to Syria from uh, Russia is a very costly operation. Um, um, what are we going to benefit from this are we gain, gonna gain something big from that so what they did the 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 question was uh, the answer was no so the cost did not justify the uh, benefits they would get so their intervention um, from a russian sense it was a successful intervention by the way their intervention was limited to military advisors special operation forces and uh, air bombardment, air, air, um, air, air force, um, uh, airplanes. Um, so uh, that was the that was the that was the scale of intervention in Syria, which actually stands as a big contrast to the American uh, deployment of force, overseas deployment, like to Afghanistan, to Iraq, and so on. Uh, huge armies moving from one place to another, tanks. Uh, artillery units, uh, armored vessels, and also whole log logistics, you know, in order to transport uh, a gallon of water, clean water from the US to Afghanistan, you have to spend, as far as I know, nine gallons of uh, fuel. Uh, um, so um, that that's the cost. So, um, and uh, into this, uh, after the first six months of the Russian intervention in Syrian civil war, uh, into the that intervention, like after six months, the American side even, uh, I think the uh, one of the, the secretary of one of those national security agencies uh, acknowledged that uh, that intervention changed the tide of the civil war. Things, uh, you know, the Assad became a, 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 a gained a, a much more powerful position than it had uh, than he had before the Russian intervention, and things did dramatically change within six months, and that was done with a limited um, cost. Um, in Africa, the third example I'm going to give you, um, Africa is beyond uh, the usual Russian um, traditional sphere of influence. Uh, although the Soviets, of course, had good relations with some uh, countries, but today, um, what happens? Um, it's beyond the logistic, uh, beyond the logistic operation, uh, the limits of logistic operation for Russian army. Uh, but there are uh, Russian mercenaries, uh, pay, pay, paid soldiers uh, in uh, in different places of Africa, in Mali, in Libya, in uh, some says in Sudan as well. I'm not, I don't know, uh, uh, but uh, definitely in Mali, in Libya, and in Central African Republic. Um, these soldiers actually, um, um, from the African point of view, I mean, from the governments of, uh, if you look at from the uh, point of view, uh, the, the, the government in Mali or government in so Central African Republic, um, they, they play an important role because the institutions in these countries are not uh, strong. Um, whoever can gather uh, 500 people with uh, Kalashnikovs uh, is ready to uh, organize a military coup in a country. Uh, so if you bring an external 500 people without any tribal or ethnic uh, connections to a certain, uh, a, you know, in, a, in, in that country, then uh, you have an independent force that you can rely on. You don't Arun, to, uh, I, have, I have to interject here. We're, we're talking about Russian presence in Africa as if it's some kind of nefarious force, which it very well could be, Russian presence in Africa is not even a drop of dot <coughs> of ink in an ocean, concerned the, considering the fact that the United States has AFRICOM and the United States has been supporting 
coups with France in the African continent going back to the Cold War. And that actually oftentimes, in the case of Sudan, which I did some research on, one of the reasons why Bashir was thought to be an enemy of the U.S. is because he was reaching out to the Russians to provide him military weaponry. So I'm not going to deny, first of all, Russia is in, Russia is in Africa, China is in Africa, France is in Africa, Germany is in Africa, everyone is in Africa, but Africa has some of the most important resources used for technological development, particularly when it comes to coal pan, particularly when it comes to, to a uranium. I get that completely. And I'm not trying to say that Russia or China or anyone is an altruistic actor in the African continent. But Wait, can you say that again for the people in the back? I said, I'm not trying to make it seem like Russia or China or anyone else is an altruistic actor in Africa because these people are here to protect, to protect their geostrategic interests. But let's make this clear. The United States does that as well, but in terms of history of causing harm, I don't think France and the United States and the NATO allies could even pop a grape in comparison to the, the damage they've done compared to the Russians. What do you got to say, but, but I, I don't think I don't think Hiram's making a point about the harm or uh, motives necessarily of Russian intervention, but rather the style in which the Russians intervene. That exactly. is to say, it's not. It's of course. I mean, the Russian presence in Africa has been relatively small historically. It wasn't even a colonial power in Africa, so it doesn't have those those kind of colonial links like France does or Britain does. This is but I think, better point, I think the point for Harun's trying to make is that he's trying to explain, and maybe I get this wrong, he's trying to explain the way the Russians intervene isn't in this like mow everything down way that the Americans do, but it's exactly. a lot more uh, is a lot more calculated and limited. And uh, yeah, uh, and I think the uh, examples you gave of it's Georgia and would Syria are actually Putin, perfect of that. Which would, would the panel say that that has a lot to do with Putin's ability, as as you were talking about earlier, Haroon? I don't. Uh, I don't think we should yeah, miss it's, the five. I asked Haroon. I asked Haroon. The panel. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, the next panel. Haroon last. I, I I completely agree with Jeannie. Uh, that's what I want to say. Um, um, uh, the Russian strategists in Moscow, uh, they are, they uh, exactly, they don't, they know that they don't have that force that Pentagon has. Uh, that's why they have, a, they have a certain style. That's what I'm saying, a very cost efficient style. And why I'm explaining all these examples, uh, uh, because when we go back to Ukraine, occupation Ukraine, urban warfare, Entering to a big urban area is by itself costly operation. And you cannot do this by only 100,000 soldiers in a country like Ukraine. This is a very costly operation. This is a billion, billion, billion dollars of operation, military operation. This is a huge cost. You uh, endorse that if you have a real gain there, economic or political gain. Does Russia, that, then that's the question. Uh, the, the following question is, is it, is it a cost-efficient thing to do uh, for Russia? No. This is not something that if, if you look at the pattern of these cost-efficient operations, uh, the use of military power in, uh, in foreign policy, in geopolitics, right? Very well, can I interject this thing. question? Was it cost-efficient in 2014? Okay. Um, uh, what happened in 2014 was a cost-efficient operation, uh, both in the Crimea and in Donbas and uh, 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 Donetsk and Lugansk uh, regions. They were cost-efficient operations. And on top of that, uh, Russian strategists, uh, including Putin, uh, has that still that card in their hands uh, if they want to destabilize Ukraine if they want to create a chaos in Ukraine, if they want to drain the economic and military power of Ukraine by engaging it into an endless conflict, they have it in Eastern Ukraine. They still, they haven't, they gained that card as a, as a, as a, as a tool of, uh, you know, as a leverage uh, and um, they did not lose it. 
why now to enter uh, Ukraine in full scale like you, American strategists usually uh, like to do uh, with uh, a huge army with artillery, with tanks, airplanes, bombardment and so on, and entering to different cities, Kharkov and uh, others, um, engaging in, in, in urban warfare, which is very costly operation. Uh, I'm not only talking about human source, but also material source. You have to calculate all these things if you're a military planner. Uh, every day uh, is, cal is uh, planned and calculated. The cost is calculated. It's, it's not logical. It's unless you are in a desperate situation, like, you know, Russia is an, under a threat that like in 1941, uh, uh, Nazi uh, attack or, um, I don't know, uh, Napoleon's <laughs> march <laughs> towards Russia. That's another story. I mean, Ukraine is not a threat like this. There are certain, uh, so you might ask me then, What's the reason of this deployment, military um, concentration of uh, mi uh, uni military units at the Ukrainian border, if the intention is not the occupation of Ukraine? So what's the intention? Why do we have those military units at the border, uh, right? That is, uh, that is, I think, the, the key question. And the, I think the answer is a specific answer, again, uh, uh, strategists in Moscow, they have a specific target and they have a relatively cheap, uh, low cost, which is like moving units from one place to another within Russia. <laughs> it doesn't cost them to you. <laughs> or building new barracks for them so that they can winter there. Uh, you can spend the winter. At, uh, so do you, you know, do you have a guess of what the specific uh, ask? Next to the I was like, do you have a guess of what the specific I mean, ask is? It was like, if the specific ask is which, you know, the, uh, outwardly, you know, the Russian government is saying um, pullback of NATO forces, especially some of the U.S. Uh, uh, stationed um, forces and 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 uh, missile batteries, um, making sure that Ukraine doesn't join the, actually, the EU. Should we yeah, believe these yeah, up front uh, as like the kind of reasoning for this, or do you see something else? Um, now, if you look from the deployment of military force, uh, that, if you look at for, from that perspective, uh, uh, moving uh, military units next to the uh, Ukrainian border has a uh, there is a target there. There is again as next to that limited military operation, uh, uh, low cost, uh, efficient, cost efficient operation, there is a specific political target there. It's not the occupation of Ukraine. Uh, uh, as I said, this is not. Uh, this doesn't fit into the style uh, Russia operates, and it's very costly. And you you need more than one hundred thousand uh, troops to do that. One hundred thousand troops is not enough for that operation uh, in the Ukrainian context. I think um, uh, you will be stuck in at some point, and uh, there will be a lot of body bags are coming back to Russia. And uh, currently, Russia. I don't. It can. It can trigger a, a revolt in Russia because things are not always. Uh, things are not very good in Russia anyway. Uh, so, what are they trying to get, Harun? What 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 do they want? Why are they doing this? What What they want? Uh, now, uh, there are different theories uh, about this. Uh, I will go straight away to the to the one that I I believe what they aim, what they want to do. Uh, um, since uh, 1710, since 18th, beginning of 18th century, the time of the, the Peter the Great, until 1991, Russia was uh, a stakeholder, uh, a, 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 um, a partner uh, in, this, uh, in European uh, security uh, system, security structure. They are since 1991, especially uh, si since the 2000s and uh, since the NATO's expansion, uh, Russia is excluded from uh, the issues, uh, discussion of uh, um, the issues of European security. In one word, Moscow forces the West by concentration of troops to finally negotiate with the Russians on the issues of European security. And if this is the target, intended target, not the occupation of Ukraine, Moscow has already gained uh, from the current standoff with the US. Uh, 
Now, uh, what are these uh, negotiated issues uh, to be concrete? I, I can give you, um, for instance, a uh, moratorium on the deployment of uh, long range, mis range missiles, um, uh, limitation on military exercises uh, in close proximity to the Russian borders, uh, including naval and air force um, training exercises and the ones imitating nuclear missile launches. These things, the, uh, these things were brought to, uh, by Moscow to the table uh, repeatedly. But the Americans usually, you know, if they don't see the, uh, if they don't see the stick, they don't talk to you because they they think that they are so. Sometimes they think that they are so superior, they don't. They they just uh, you know <laughs> another another guy is bubbling uh, uh, at another corner of the world you know the, uh, um, so um, they they don't take it seriously sometimes uh, and uh, um, and uh, um, those kind of European security issues they want to uh, negotiate uh, uh, with the US that's why they said okay we will not initially we will not, initially they said we will not discuss these things with the Europeans. We want to talk to the master, right? So uh, they directly uh, approached the US and said, uh, talk to, to France, Germany, NATO headquarters. These are all uh, smoke screen. You know, these are all like small players. We want to deal with the US because we want to be uh, stakeholders of the European security uh, structure, not exclusive. Hanun, I'd like to ask a question and interject based on... Uh... Being excluded. Uh, we are a European oh, sure. country, see themselves as a European country, and they are excluded. Um, um, that's, the, that's the goal. And it's the, this is the goal. This cost-efficient operation is going well because every day for the last two or three weeks, um, Americans and Russians are negotiating. Right? Behind the doors, in front of the doors, I mean, like behind the curtain, in front of the curtain. They're constantly negotiating, exchanging letters, um, and hopefully something will come out from that. If not, there are two, it seems to me like there are two now negotiation channels. One of them with the uh, German and the French government and Russians, uh, those, those three, that European channel, right? And direct with Washington, D.C. Um, because, and the timing is also interesting. Uh, perhaps there are different uh, explanations why the timing is right now. Well, Pascal wants to jump in with a question. Pascal, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I want to uh, jump in with a question based on a very good video that I found on YouTube that was shared with me from uh, someone who works in uh, foreign policy, works, in, works at the UN. And it's called How the United States Created Vladimir Putin. And the speaker is a man come, called named Vladimir Posner. You might know, I'll be familiar with him. I, don't, I believe he I watched worked. the video. I know Posner, yes. Okay. And one of the things that I found fascinating in the video, and I'm not going to take it too much time, is that it explains that the, Putin, the rise of Putin is the direct consequence of the United States breaking very key promises to the post-Soviet Russian nation in terms of NATO expansion into the Russian sphere, sphere in which it was told that we're not going to cross XYZ Rubicon, we promise. And the United States continually crossed those Rubicons. And that the United States continual crossing of those Rubicons had a direct correlation to the very kind of reactionary, more conservative, much more rash Russian nationalistic posture and rise of Putin. And what I'm saying is that one of the things that I find lacking in the analysis about what's going on in Ukraine is twofold. Number one, up until recently, and I shout out to Cuba for really giving me the details, up until recently, what I mean recently within five years, 80% of the natural gas that Russia sends to Europe goes through the pipelines in Ukraine. That's a fact. Now it's down to 40%. And it's down to 40% because the Russians made a particular pipeline deal with the Germans. And the Russians have been actively trying to diminish the role of Ukraine as, a, as an operational point to ship its natural gas. 
So one of the reasons why Russia is still interested in Ukraine and not having the United States encroach in that territory is that economically, it has a role in its economic sovereignty as a nation state. Doesn't mean the Ukrainians don't have a right to negotiate their posture, but that's one thing that should be considered. And number two, the Russians being angered about the United States offering to have Ukraine or even the Kazakh regions and to NATO is the same in my eyes as if Russia is in Mexico and say, hey, listen, the BRICs are strong, join the BRICs, and we're going to put military weapons in the BRICs. How do you think the United States is going to react? I think, I think, assuming I just want to add to this. I say, assuming if the BRICs were strong, that's, 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 yeah. I, I want to add, I, I think Pascal is, I, I mean, like, I'd like to hear Harun's take on this, but yeah, I think, you know, the, like, the reactionary stance of the Russian government is clearly, if we look at it in a historical context, a product of, as Pascal says, you know, the, the westward expansion of NATO. The, the Russians might have consented to Poland or, or to Hungary or those countries coming into the uh, NATO, uh, but like once NATO began pushing into former Soviet uh, republics, then this was bound to cause a reaction. And this is this is a pattern we see throughout history. Revanchism in France was a product of the Prussian victory over uh, of France in 1871, which led to uh, France, you know, going back and after the First World War, you know, uh, defeating, uh, imposing a very brutal uh, uh, peace treaty on Germany, which led to German revanchism in return. So when we look at the way that capitalist powers uh, interact with each other, we see this as, as, as a pattern. So anyone with an ounce of sense would have known that if you start, uh, you know, pushing uh, uh, pushing your alliance system uh, and your political hegemony further and further eastward, it was bound to, at some point, going to uh, elicit a reaction from uh, Russia, which, uh, as it recovered, from the defeat in the Cold War has began to reassert its own uh, sphere of influence. This is not a normative argument, but this is like international relations 101. So this is a problem that is fundamentally provoked uh, by the uh, the United States and NATO expansion. And now, does that mean does that mean that the, we absolve the Russians of you know that that. Their, uh, side in this, bullying their neighboring countries. There's a reason that these neighboring countries are pissed off uh, with the Russians. You know, they don't all, all have a lovely experience of uh, Russian rule. But the the presence of the United States makes the security situation in Europe worse. I firmly believe if America withdrew from the European continent, withdrew all troops, all that, it would be a lot easier to come to some kind of peaceful a uh, 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 security system uh, which the United States is not included with and Russia would be happy. And Russia simply does not have the resources to be this like monstrous imperial power. It's an absolute freaking joke to think that they could suddenly invade uh, 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 Germany. They will bully their neighbors in the most cost-effective way that they can. What we need is a detente across the continent and the American presence uh, I just don't think is beneficial to that state of affairs. Okay, some quick facts, Jason. Bear with me here. Mm -hmm. The United States annual GDP is upwards close to $22 trillion. China's GDP is about almost $14, 15000000000000 trillion. Russia's GDP is not even $2 trillion. That's a fact. This is not a country that has the economic, geostrategic, that has the military because of nuclear weapons, it does not have the money to be a force to compete with the United States in the world at all. That's that's exactly what I tried to say, uh, Pascal. That's why when the strategists in Moscow, when they plan something at, uh, you know, at international scale, um, they make this cost analysis very carefully. What we are going to lose and what we in return, what we are going to gain because of the limited budget, because of the limited resources. So, uh, and occupying a, a 
whole country, a huge country, Ukraine is a big country, uh, uh, with, uh, with, a, with a population, most of it ready to fight, uh, 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 that's a big cost for any military planner, uh, not only for Russian planners, for any military planner. You have to think twice. Uh, if you have limited sources, you have more than twice. Uh, so then the question is, what is the aim and what we can do in a cost-effective manner to achieve that goal, to achieve that aim, to gain that, uh, to have that benefit, to have that uh, without a limit, with a, with a limited cost. Hmm? So that's that's how they think. That's how they operate in different uh, theater zones of uh, conflict. Uh, in Georgia, even in Ukraine, even in Ukraine, first um, there was um, in 2014 when uh, the president uh, uh, of Ukraine at the time, Yanukovych, uh, deposed. Uh, there were some um, uh, pro-Russian uh, uh, demonstrations in eastern Russian-spoken part of Ukraine. Uh, I mean, like. Um, um, in the eastern corner of Ukraine, in Don, Don, exactly this Don Donetsk and so on, um, the Russian strategists thought, if we can, <clears throat> sorry, uh, hijack these demonstrations, manipulate them, and turn it into pro-Russian and anti-government uh, that was the, the new government against the government in Kiev, and turn it perhaps into a separatist movement, we can uh, gain, uh, and that is a, a cost-effective measure, right? Instead of sending, in, instead of uh, um, uh, intervening that, uh, to the new reality in Ukraine. And they did it. Um, they uh, manipulated the ongoing um, uh, the, uh, discontent uh, ag against uh, the new government uh, in Kiev after uh, Yanukovych was uh, removed. Um, they sent some provocateurs. Did they send? Yes, they sent some provocateurs. They, did they send some money? Probably they sent some money as well. Uh, some Russian agents crossed the border to eastern Ukraine and uh, helped to organize that demonstrators uh, to, let's say, go and occupy the government uh, uh, buildings, key locations, in Donetsk and so on, uh, in Lugansk as well. So this happened. <clears throat> um, and then they perhaps, did they arm them to fight against the uh, uh, Ukrainian army and uh, start a, a, a separatist movement? Probably they did. They armed them. The Russians armed them, right? Those separatist, uh, uh, mo uh, emerging separatist movements. Uh, they said, okay, op open check for you, blank check. You know, uh, you want... Um, Kalashnikovs, here we go, Kalashnikovs. I mean, it's cheaper um, uh, than sending an army unit. This happened for, for the first six months until the end of, uh, from the Feb February 2014 until the end of um, uh, July 2014. Uh, because the central government, the new central government, uh, pro-Western uh, central government, I don't go to, into discussion like how they came to power how Yanukovych was deposed, what happened in Kiev is another chapter. But the new government uh, uh, launched a, a military offensive against this separatist, um, 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 let's say, separatist uh, um, um, militia, militia, militia uh, you know, separatist groups, and they uh, squeezed them to the to the uh, corner. They squeezed them to the Russian border, like uh, they gained, they retook the, the the control of this. Uh, territories were which were controlled by the separatists uh, till that moment, right? They they pushed them to the ground. Uh, when the Russian uh, uh, strategists in Moscow understood by the end of July 2014 that uh, this uh, uh, support of sending a couple of uh, you know uh, advisors and uh, ammunition uh, uh, um, uh, uh, across the border is not enough, we need to intervene further. You see, they sent uh, some army units, uh, soldiers, without insignia, without any Russian uh, 
uh, flags and um, you know names uh, um, uh, of uh, um, symbols of the army, um, they they uh, uh, send them across the border to fight against the uh, next to the uh, uh, um, separatists against the uh, Ukrainian central uh, government uh, military uh, uh, units. So, uh, but then still they kept the cost law they did they uh, they avoided uh, a direct confrontation uh, and they uh, till the end they um, uh, refused to recognize acknowledge that there were russian soldiers and russian military so i mean members of russian military officers and soldiers and equipment on the ground they refu refused to acknowledge it uh, in order to avoid a uh, full scale war because that would be costly and that was not the aim the aim was in order to gain a leverage within ukraine uh, to have a sec a part of ukrainian territory that can be that could be used in the future um, uh, if the country uh, for instance uh, to first of all to avoid U nato membership of ukraine because without uh, territorial integrity uh, without the um, if, if the if the central government cannot control the whole country, if there is a border conflict with another country, or if there is a separatist group uh, holding a part of the territory as a hostage, uh, the central government uh, cannot go and knock the door of NATO and say, "Hey, take me as a member," and NATO will not take that risk and take uh, accept that. <laughs> this that's 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 uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's that's for sure. So that's why they. Uh, guaranteed that with the, with this low cost intervention um, and also kept it as a leverage in the future to in, in case to destabilize and uh, drain the resources of Ukrainian economy and military uh, in a in an endless conflict like this why I say endless because if there is a separatist movement uh, in a country uh, which uh, also uh, secured an external power and if they have also an ideology and if they have a couple of hundreds of uh, trained um, uh, um, military uh, armed force trained uh, uh, like warriors uh, soldiers uh, partisans whatever you call it it's it's nearly impossible to uh, finish that you know uh, if there's an external supporter if there is an ideology uh, mobilize the uh, mass and if there is an ongoing um, um, uh, you know um, armed um, training of uh, a certain amount of um, um, young men is enough uh, for a few hundreds is, is enough actually uh, you will not finish it uh, it will continue uh, um, so it will it will generate and then the population will also will fed up with this conflict the uh, regular army entering daytime and then the guerrilla entering at night in the villages and towns and people will fed up and they will they will be alienated uh, they will be against the central government in most of the cases because they will have the burden of this conflict being the being their villages and towns being the battleground you see so uh, it's very difficult um, unless you you use a real brutal force and crash it and and you know you you have to be uh, uh, you, there, there are certain cases that happens uh, in his history it happened uh, uh, and but there, there wasn't any external uh, assistance um, I can give you one good example American uh, war of independence Britain in 1770s was the America of today I mean the most powerful empire in the world in 1770s nearly i mean they, they were they were of course rivals like french uh, and spanish but without the external support the american uh, uprising against the central authorities i doubt it would be uh, successful believe me well, there were a a big support from the spanish and french uh, in order to you know to to be to be to be friend uh, uh, or to uh, being you know that how was it uh, the enemy of your enemy is my friend principle they followed uh, no no uh, no separatist movement or revolution has ever been successful without external uh, support in the modern era exactly and the reason exactly. for that is 
because the organizational and institutional capacity of the nation state is so powerful that you cannot organize a countervailing force unless you receive the type of support. I don't, I cannot, yeah. and I cannot think of one case in which you do not have, uh, in which you don't have external, uh, direct external support or some kind of international shift in opinion that makes it untenable for the imperial power to stay. And speaking of support, so one, case, hold on, hold on, hold on, one second, one second. Sorry, 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 just to, to, to add up, in Ukrainian case, those separatists, uh, those separatists are already a card in the uh, Russian hands as a leverage. So they don't have to uh, send a huge regular army in order to, uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, to gain leverage. God damn, he had to bring out the Turkish. Uh-oh. You know it's bad when Gene's got to bring out the Turkish. Jason wanted to jump in. I Go just ahead, wanted Jason. to say that this is all the bonus after hours that you guys are getting for free because this is the Saturday free show. And I would like to thank everyone that has sent a super chat for supporting shout out Landrew. To shout super out chat. to Landrew for the big yeah. super chat. We really appreciate that because that allows us to continue to do this show and it allows me to pay for much better Wi-Fi here in Mexico. Um, now, we, I think Harun has done an uh, excellent job of even explaining the Russian position and historical like uh, relevance of, of, of what the happenings are with uh, Ukraine. Um, coming from the U.S. perspective, um, you got Joe Biden, you know, like largely even the, like the spokespeople for the military industrial complex saying there's no invade, like there's no going to be no occupation. There's no going to be deployment of uh, U.S. troops in defense of Ukraine. The most they're willing to do is send, you know, military equipment, um, especially targeting, you know, Russian uh, armor capabilities. Um, so even like the response, if there was a uh, Russian invasion, which I think we've beat the horse dead into dust. That that's not actually what's happening. Uh, but I guess what would your response be to a like American media? But I think, pro- but I, I see it as very very big problem is there's a lot of people on the you know quote unquote left that says, well, what should we do about Russia um, in this situation? Um, Is the question to me? Yeah, what would your response ah, be? I see. Uh, before, uh, thank you. For, thank you for that. That's uh, that's an important point. Before that, uh, there the, one of the listeners I think wrote um, a, a, an important uh, detail here, um, which uh, where, where is it? Um, oh, I. Uh, ah, sorry, there was actually mass resistance to the Maidan regime in Donbass, especially after they started burning Russians in Odessa. I know those, I, I didn't want to go into the details, uh, what happened in 2014. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, you are right, uh, uh, there, were, there were mass protests. Uh, I, I tried to watch all of them as much as I could from afar, uh, um, follow them. Um, I, I took the general picture uh, you know the this to summarize the whole event in in a few uh, sentences in a short paragraph but uh, many things happened in those days uh, and uh, there are different interpretations of course what happened in kiev uh, uh, in those days as well in february um, so we are aware of so um now um Look, there is a there is an interesting positioning uh, of the crisis in in general. Uh, uh, I see uh, one of them is this: uh, Russia wants to re-establish a Soviet a Russian slash Soviet empire. The other one is this conflict is about uh, ah, and the con- and the continuity of this uh, um, argument is uh, Russia needs Ukraine in order to re-establish the uh, Russian Empire, right? Now, um, there, is a, there is an important aspect there. Um, I mean, um, there's, a, there's a logic within itself, 
Um, if you want, because Russian uh, historically, last 300 years, if you look at it, um, uh, possession of you, the territory that we call Ukraine now, uh, the Ukraine, most of the Ukraine now, uh, uh, boosted the the Russian state power with its sources. Uh, losing Ukraine, uh, even in, during the Second World War, <clears throat> when Ukraine uh, was uh, the whole Ukraine and beyond that was occupied by the uh, Nazi German forces, uh, it was a huge blow to the Soviet uh, economy, military uh, power. Uh, I mean. The uh, coal mines, um, uh, grain, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the amount of grain that is cultivated in Ukraine, and so forth. So the Ukraine, in a way, um, multiplied uh, during the Russian imperial times and in the Soviet period. Uh, overall, uh, the unions or empires' uh, power multiplied. It multiplied it. Um, um, so that's why there is a logic uh, between these two statements. First, Russia wants to uh, reestablish uh, a new empire, reconstruct the empire. The second statement is Moscow needs Ukraine to do that. That's why they eventually want to occupy or incorporate Ukraine. They are doing bit by bit. But uh, so these two are uh, interrelated, but the question is if Moscow really wants to do that or not. If Moscow has the capacity to do that or not, uh, because uh, Ukraine is one thing, but then if you go to Central Asia, for instance, uh, if you look at the Soviet economy, Central Asia was actually uh, overall, I, I suspect, was not a, a, a threat. Uh, Moscow uh, economic source that Moscow enjoyed much, but actually it was a territory where Moscow invested in uh, a lot uh, uh, in, in terms of infrastructure, education, health services in an exponentially growing uh, local uh, population. Uh, you know, taking a country as bad as Afghanistan in 1920 and bringing it to, to a level, social uh, level of let's say, uh, Czechoslovakia uh, or uh, Yugoslavia uh, in 1970s, 80s, you know, something like this. Uh, you, you, need to do, you need to make a huge, uh, uh, th that's a huge cost. Um, it wasn't always a benefit for the union uh, now. And many Russians in Moscow now think that they are happy that they got rid of this, in a way, burden. Uh, they don't need to. Uh, um, invest in uh, and develop a huge territory, right? Uh, so, um, I mean, these are all disputed uh, issues. That's what I'm saying. They are not like uh, black and white uh, issues. Uh, uh, the, another argument is uh, this is a, a conflict between evil and good forces. You know, uh, Ukraine is now uh, become part of uh, 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 forces of good, uh, 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 freedom and democracy, and Russia is the force of uh, um, like the evil, uh, like in a Star Wars movie. Uh, um, and um, that's why this is a clash of good and bad, and we have to stand next to the uh, good, right? Uh, against the evil forces. <clears throat> now, uh, this is an interesting, uh, of course, and very uh, repeating uh, interpretation of uh, uh, um, uh, what's going on in, in different parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> I usually do, do not follow that, uh, agree with those kind of interpretations because the world is not uh, a Star Wars movie, uh, uh, you know, um, play screen or you know, sc uh, a script. Um, and we are not in a Hollywood mo uh, studio. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, there was a recent uh, Rand Corporation uh, report actually on that, exactly on this uh, uh, point and uh, what the ex experts at run corporation says that um, um, there is this uh, understanding true um, that um, in the west um, 
like um, uh, how should I put it? Um, uh, um, let me check the exact note uh, for you. Uh, I recently read it because it was interesting. Um, so um, that the Ukraine um, Rus Russian strategists, um, 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 the, 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 according to Run Corporation, there are no examples of uh, Russian leaders speaking of their fear of the uh, demonst demonstration effects of Ukrainian democratic success on the Russian people. So, um, so the, because the theory is, it's claimed that the Putin and his uh, um, team uh, worries that if Ukraine becomes a successful democracy uh, and a prosperous democracy, the Russian people will demand the same. Right? That's the theory. So that's why they are uh, attacking Ukraine. They are bullying Ukraine. Uh, in order to destabilize uh, the country uh, so that uh, democracy will not be uh, successful in Ukraine. So we are here in a, in a, in a battle of uh, evil forces and good forces like, uh, um, you know, the Lord of the Rings kind of thing. And uh, we, uh, we need to stand together with the forces of good. Now, uh, the th problem uh, with this theory is that uh, there is no uh, fact uh, that would prove that um, 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 uh, Russian leaders um, they, uh, have this kind of fear of a demonstration effect of Ukrainian democratic success on the Russian uh, 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 people. Uh, yet there is uh, abundant evidence that the Russian elites, political elites uh, in Moscow, have a very low opinion of the Ukrainian counterparts. Uh, the intended, um, you know, the uh, the Russian government, um, uh, and you can also find ordinary Russian people uh, thinking like this, do not believe that they are uh, the Ukrainian uh, elites are capable of achieving uh, more than a half state without Western assistance. You see, so let alone become a thriving democracy. So um, that's why it's important also. Um, how Russian elites look at these things, uh, not uh, how the uh, think tanks in Washington, D.C. sees uh, how Russians think, <laughs> you know, like their interpretation of Russian mind. But actually, what... Go ahead, Pat. Thing? Yeah, I, I got to interject here, Harold, because one thing, we started off saying that Russia wants to create or recreate a Russian empire. Uh, my question is, how do we know that Russia doesn't simply want to protect its surrounding well, former nation-state co-partners? He didn't say that, though. No. He, said, he said that's one of the theories that is being put okay. forward, right? If, I, if that's one of the... Th I, 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 I didn't say that. I said Probably this is one of the theories put forward okay. as a causation, like the why those troops are at the border, right? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And one, one answer is Russia wants to re-establish, rebuild an empire. Well, that... Another, another theory is um, because uh, Russia is against <clears throat> development of democracy uh, and civil society in Ukraine. That's why they want to destabilize and uh, create a kind of chaotic atmosphere in Ukraine. That's what they are doing since 2014, right? Yeah. And there are yeah. also answers to each of these uh, uh, theories, explanations. Yeah, but in all the of those case, theories which come out of the West, as usually are not premised on understanding that Russia has had its sovereign territory or th the threat of its sovereignty subsidized by the West for going back to the fall of the Soviet Union and that maybe Russia just wants to protect itself from U.S. and NATO expansion. That makes a very logical, simple reason why we have this guy, and I'm not a Putin fan at all, why we have Putin being so reactionary and being, I would say, somewhat paranoid. And he's, why everyone's like, Putin wants to destabilize NATO and the West. Well, what has the West been doing to destabilize the Soviet Union and Russia for 30 years or longer? This is ridiculous. This is a direct consequence of the myopia that we get from listening to the West in terms of its narratives of the world of who is the bad guy and who is the enemy. And I'm not a Russia stand at all. And I'll be very transparent. I have family that lives in Russia. I have two uncles who study in the Soviet, in the Soviet Union. I'm not a fan of Putin. 
But I also know that the U.S. lies and the West lies about who the quote unquote enemy is for its own geostrategic purposes. Not that Russia wouldn't do it either, but my point is that we're not getting any balance here because we don't understand that one of the main reasons that we're in this conflict situation is because the United States has been encroaching on Russian sovereignty for 30 years. Well, I think the other part is here it comes. I would, uh, I would add to that. I think this is important. This is what uh, this is what American exceptionalism is in practice. Um, uh, Americans uh, like to think that their government has good intentions, even when bad things happen. Right? There's this whole mythology of American innocence that we tried our best and and we messed up. And we're trying to defend democracy and we're trying to do all these good things. When in fact, well, there may be cases where American intervention might lead to a, a marginally better outcome. The vast majority of these interventions are A, not really done for the reasons that are being sold on the tin. And two, usually have a really detrimental outcome. But the American public uh, has this belief that Amer when America acts in the world, it's acting as a force for good, as a moral uh, force. And this is what Kuba always talks about when he comes on the show. It's this whole Americans like to see that there's good guys and bad guys. And when I tell you know, if you go around the world, you know, most people are going to see the Americans as the bad guys, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the 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 Americans like to see, sort of portray themselves. Uh, even in the popular culture, as the plucky underdogs fighting against the hegemonic imperial power. Just notice in Star Wars, the rebels have American accents and the Empire has British accents. But the reality <laughs> is the United States is the Empire, right? It, you know, it, it's why American war movies, like, how do you make a heroic war, war movie when you're the Americans and you're literally the ones with all the arms, the guns, and the weapons fighting against, like, People who may be bad dudes, but are like fighting against like massive odds. So mm -hmm. America lives in this delusion of of good versus evil, which leads even the American liberal establishment to go into this delusional fantasy world where every opponent, every enemy that America has is Nazi Germany. When in fact, even Nazi Germany to some people in the world, like the people of India, with the good guys. Ladies and gentlemen, you just witnessed the TIR tag team. Here it comes! Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! I think some of this stuff is like just, uh, it's it's obviously false, but you know, like obviously these narratives don't get like weaved together. But when you have the United States securing, um, was it uh, Saudi and um, Emirati oil to run through Qatar to save democracy in Ukraine? You know, like what what is what is really happening here? You know, like if you're trying to build an alternate supply chain for uh, oil and natural like oil and natural gas for you know half a continent that is it's almost impossible to be established in order to quote unquote save democracy you know like this just Bro, doesn't make any sense what, and, marcus, and marcus but they were say they saved kuwaiti democracy in 1991 and they had to intervene in case saddam hussein went and rolled over saudi democracy you know <laughs> you know yeah. like, they could they tied the first democratically elected president in haiti twice and led an assassination of the last president we had in haiti it's all in the millennial that's all after 2000 crack a lacken yeah, so I think one has to understand that America's actions in the world usually don't have great results. That doesn't mean other players, though. We we sh we sh we have to be re we have to simultaneously recognize that America is the biggest imperial power and does you know bad bad things with bad dudes and supports bad regimes, while simultaneously not falling into the trap of thinking that the CIA is like a giga chad organization that is pulling the strings around uh, around the world and that the and that uh, non-americans 
are not capable of producing their own assholes and their own reactionaries who act for their own reasons. I remember one Bolivian leftist I know said, look, you know, America certainly was happy about the coup uh, that was against Evo Morales, but only a Yankee could believe that our own racist white elite wasn't capable of trying to launch a reaction. Mm. And so, you know, we, we have to avoid uh, uh, avoid inverting American exceptionalism uh, to understanding that global imperialism and global capitalism is a system. Mm. America is the center of that system. There are parts of the system that work in harmony with the United States, whether that's Canada, the European Union, the United States, and then there are capitalist powers that uh, have counter-hegemonic uh, aspirations like Russia. Uh, but they're all part of this same uh, system, which by and large relies on exploitative industries, the exploitation of labor, uh, uh, political and economic oppression, uh, and all those bad things that we're against. So, you know, for example, put it in a very concrete terms, like when people get all moralistic uh, about, oh, you, let's say you went and you spoke on Russia today. Well, that's fine if you're using that as a platform, because I don't see that as better than the worse than the New York Times, which lied the American public into a war in Iraq. You use the platform. Nigga, you know, what? Don't drink the Kool-Aid, right? You know, don't yeah. sell yourself out for uh, don't but don't drink the Kool-Aid. Use the tools that you have at your hand. But be aware that all these people whether it's the American corporate media, whether it's the state medias of other capitalist powers, they're all playing the they're all playing the same game, and that is the maintenance of the international capitalist system and the international political order. Because the Russians are not trying to fucking uh, counter the United States by building global socialism; they just want their own imperial sphere of influence as well, just as they used, you know, just as they used to have. So America is the big dog, but there are other little dogs that can be dangerous <laughs> if you're close to them. I don't, Would you I say don't that was a fair that. assessment? Th that that is a very fair assessment. I don't I don't have any more sound effects that are appropriate because I have extremely <laughs> inappropriate sound effects at this point. Give us an Someone... inappropriate sound effect. No. Better question Someone is what are you doing with the inappropriate they... sound effects without the show? <laughs> That's the better right, question. Yes. So, you have an interjection. Sorry, sorry. someone asked uh, how how much how much of the taking of Crimea was about maintaining the naval base at Sevastopol, which the lease for what for was about to expire. Uh, that's a fa very fair question. Uh, I think okay. uh, the Crimean case is a complicated I think one. Responsible for. Pardon. I think there was some feedback. Oh yes, the uh, the uh, the the Crimean case is a is a very I think complicated. But on the one hand, that was a land grabbing, like uh, taking part of a neighbor's <laughs> land, right? Uh, that's it. I mean, there is no excuse. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, as um, um, uh, as Pascal mentioned earlier, um, advancement of expansion of NATO eastwards for the last 20 years um, perceived uh, by Moscow as a threat. And uh, once there was a, a pro-Western uh, government in U Ukraine, uh, the Russian uh, strategist thought that the next step would be losing those naval bases in Crimea, um, and uh, and in a, in a in a peninsula where eighty percent of the population <coughs> are ethnically Russian, and uh, in a peninsula which was given to Ukraine within the Soviet context in the nineteen fifties, uh, before that Crimea was part of the Russian Federation, um, um, end of nineteen fifty. So. Uh, there, there, there. So there are many, uh, let's say, uh, factors there. Uh, but I think um, the the solution. If you ask me, what will be the solution, or what would be the solution to the uh, overall uh, situation here? Uh, the Americans will not give the guarantee to Russia uh, of Ukraine 
uh, not being accepted as a member to NATO, uh, uh, you know, there, there won't be a written guarantee. They refuse to give it and they will not give it. And actually, Moscow probably predicted that Americans would refuse that. That would be impossible to ex ex expect from Washington uh, to agree uh, to a clause like this, like uh, we will not let Ukraine, uh, you create you uh, for for foreseeable future. That's that's a that's a, a great power. Do not uh, uh, sign uh, uh, to, up to the, those kind of commitments, big commitments like this, um, unless they're in a very uh, desperate situation, right? Uh, so, uh, and I, I'm sure uh, strategists in Moscow uh, force, foreseen this. They knew that Americans would refuse that. That was the uh, highest, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, order uh, uh, they would ask for the highest thing that the biggest thing they would ask uh, as uh, you know uh, they aim 12 in order to t target uh, 10 or 9 so uh, they actually uh, by being part of these negotiations they prove that they are part of the european security structure and they are not they cannot be omitted they cannot be seen as nobody uh, in the room, you know, like uh, they are now, uh, they, they, they push the, the uh, Western capitals to be accepted as a, as a stakeholder or uh, as a partner within the European security system. They, you need to negotiate with Russia before you uh, make new arrangements in European security uh, structure, right? That's the, that's the thing they wanted to aim and that's what they got it. Um, the, uh, on the other hand, probably there will be some um, um, positive results in terms of uh, arms uh, controls, um, where um, uh, military maneuvers, military uh, exercises, um, uh, there will be some agreements on that. Uh, in in Ukrainian case, uh, part in particular in Ukrainian case, um, the ideal solution um, is, uh, to my mind. Um, okay, do do you hear me? By the way, is there a technical issue? Or mm -hmm. Is it okay? Uh, the the ideal solution. Um, uh, I mean, there's no ideal solution, but let's say optimal optimal solution, right? Uh, would be um, re organize the referendum in the Crimea uh, where the international um, observers are also allowed to uh, come and observe um, and uh, although the outcome will be uh, most probably um, um, obvious more than 50 percent will prefer to stay uh, within the Russian Federation but it will endorse uh, and give an international legitimacy uh, to Russia to keep the uh, peninsula. That's that's probably maximum what Russia can <clears throat> can say yes, uh, unless they say uh, that's a done deal, finished deal. We don't do anything in the Crimea. We won't step back. Uh, you cannot force us. That's it. This is a closed uh, case, right? Uh, uh, in the Crimean case. Uh, or, or as I said, there can be some uh, 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 rerun of the referendum uh, with international observers. Um, this uh, in Donbas and uh, uh, Lugansk, uh, in these uh, territories, um, um, and a kind of a cultural autonomy uh, can be uh, can be um, on the table, and that was uh, what uh, Minsk to uh, the second round of Minsk agreement. Uh, was um there was a clause like this in the agreement uh, ceasefire agreement that uh, there would be a kind of a cultural or i, I don't know administrative uh, autonomy there uh, that autonomy can be established um uh, and which would which would for now uh, which would uh, uh, guarantee uh, peace um um about uh, ukrainian membership to nato um there could be a, a tacit agreement on that but more importantly uh, because what russian uh, expert says uh, is not only about ukraine entering nato but it's also nato entering ukraine 
So in in uh, in in de jure in in juridical terms, Ukraine might not be uh, the a member of NATO, but if uh, uh, NATO troops or if NATO uh, military equipment is deployed in Ukraine, then uh, the the result will be the same. So for us, they say uh, uh, the the end result will be the same anyway. Huh? So uh, perhaps Ukraine, okay, will not be uh, accepted. Um, um, at least it will not. No, nobody said that it will accept it anyway. <laughs> uh, especially with territorial disputes and so on. Um, but, but if not, not so the case is not Ukraine entering NATO, but NATO entering Ukraine. We don't want that as well. So. There the point, there the discussion point is, um, can we have a um, neutral territory like um, like uh, Austria after the Second World War or Finland uh, after the Second World War? Because there are cases like this as a, as a um, you know, as a no man's land in that sense. Uh, that's of course uh, depend on the negotiators, uh, Russian and American uh, negotiation teams. <clears throat> I suspect Moscow would be happy with that uh, eventually, uh, but if uh, Americans would be happy with that or not, or if Ukrainian uh, government would find themselves, uh, government uh, uh, officials would find themselves in a secure position uh, um, uh, with that solution. I don't know. Well, we are at a long time, guys. We're at two. <laughs> Jason We're was like, let's not go for three hours because it takes me ages to upload the video, or upload the audio. But the now audio. he's got a big, juicy audio are. to upload. Big, thick, <laughs> a, girthy audio file to. A uh, big, thick, girthy yeah. audio file. I have a couple of announcements. I'd like to say, people, if you want to watch uh, Beyond the Racial Wealth Gap, on the Diet Soap with me and Doug Lane. Check it out. Also, please go check out the interview we did for the Real News Network with uh, Chris Hedges. Also, check out the first one we've done with uh, Adolf oh, Reed. Please like, subscribe, and become a patron to help us grow and look for our work on the Real News Network with This Is Revolution podcast. And don't forget to follow Marcus as well if you guys are Twitch users on left flank vets also marcus will be joining me and a cast of others on the new sports show we have called beyond the red zone the first episode is already up where we discuss uh the nfc championship and how i feel about protests in sports <laughs> and and so much more uh, Shout out to my my, uh, my host and my partner here, Jason Miles, is going to be on a special show on Monday for five hours. I understand. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be there for five hours. I don't. I don't have that much to say. Five hours of Jason. Usually, only very special ladies get five hours of Jason. Whoa, Man. whoa, whoa! TMI. And now you guys know the real reason why I disappear from the screen. <laughs> 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 no, it's really what's a sad the name, life. What's no the name of the show you're going to be on, Jason? I'll be on the David Feldman show. Um, so shout out to Rodrigo and M. Toussaint for uh, telling me to go on uh, this thing David Feldman does. It's really cool, actually, called uh, Office Hours. And they introduced me, and he asked me a couple questions. And like my answer is like, I want you on Monday. So, I mean, you can join me as well, Pascal, because. Uh, oh, really? Word? I'm invited right to the party. Yeah, yeah, no, he didn't want to just talk to me. He knows that there's another black guy. Cool. It is Black History Month. He can't, you know. Yeah, you know, I told him. I said it's perfect world. timing. It's February. It's Black History Month. You can have your diversity and yeah. and prove you know black person. equity. You are yeah, a diversity. Are you between crumpets? No, no, he's a regular white guy. He doesn't eat crumpets. Crumpets are nice. I've been uh, Zal has discovered crumpets since he came to England. And he now goes around the kitchen going, crumpet, crumpet, crumpet. <laughs> Tells like, all don't go to like, school in America calling cookies biscuits because the kids will beat him up. Yeah. The other hey, what you talk about? That ain't a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> My mama made this <laughs> look like that, them cookies. <laughs> You're the weirdest foreign Mexican I've ever seen, Zal. 
It's <laughs> honestly surprising how good Gene is at doing the the Missouri Southern accent. It's, it's I've been I've been in Southwest well. Missouri for for, for yeah. like five years now. Um, but Haroon, we'll just say thank you so much for dropping. I feel like three volumes of uh, European history <laughs> in the you know uh, for Kazakhstan and uh, Ukraine and, and Russia. So thank you so He's much. He's not Haroon for nothing. Yeah, which I you know, like. We don't have the time, but I feel I like there's an issue the with you're, you're... the. I, well, I just said there's. I have concern with the amount of like just military hardware the U.S. is going to try and dump into Europe before they're willing to, you know, actually like try and relax any of these things. But we'll see how that goes. Thank you. Anything guys exciting going watching. on with you, Harun? Any live performances where people can go and see the Harun <laughs> in his classroom? <laughs> Uh, I, think I cannot Go beat I cannot beat your your performance here at all. I, I cannot well, how is this. Weights. He's lifting weights in them London gyms. He's walking yeah, in there. Right. Getting huge. <laughs> Go see the Harun. Go see the Harun. Lift. Exactly. My lift. alter ego, the uh, heavy heavyweight lifter. That yeah, exactly. My alter ego is must be very busy on the internet. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Dead lifted those, 40 yeah. stone. Well, that's a QGB you know, the, operation, the, the guys. That's a QGB operation to diminish my reputation. They put those <laughs> pictures there. It's the deep state. It's the deep state coming for you, Kuba. Well, you think it's bad for Harun? You know what my boss's name is? Hmm. Kathleen Kennedy. Can you imagine how many angry oh. emails she gets uh like by accident? I just I just could, couldn't imagine that. You know, I was like, all the nerds. I'm like, oh, my God, Kathleen, that's so unfortunate for you because all the nerds are angry at Kathleen Kennedy. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, that is a, I'm That's sorry. like that guy named Matt, like, like some journalist named Matt Gertz. Oh, yeah, yeah, Matt Gertz. He always gets Matt Gates things. Yeah. <laughs> that sucks. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Haroon, once again for coming on. Thank you. Chat. Thank you guys for engaging. I heard that there was a bit of a spiciness in the chat between anarchists and trots. You know what I always say. Actually, I don't always say it. I'm making it up now. So I'm always going to say it from here on out. It's good to know a little bit of history, but when you spend way too much time in the past, you are not focused on what's going on in the present. Ooh. Hmm. That was good. Ooh, that was pretty good. Cool. Cool. I fucking oh, freestyle oh, that. Yeah. You fucking freestyle that. You eating those tasty edibles? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Did you see that? Did you we, see my to, we, we should do a. We should do a. We should do a, a survey of our patrons because I think you could do surveys on Patreon to see mm -hmm. who's an anarchist, who's a truck, and who's an ML. Yeah. No, we don't want to know that. I don't want to know. I don't, don't want to know what you are. I don't want to know. Any preferences you have? I People just, want to know what tags you're wearing. You know, we've got the yeah. Crips. The oh, what's, what's dude, that you I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't give a shit. You know, cops pulled me over one time. You know what they didn't ask me? Political affiliation. Whether you were a trot? Yep, did not give a shit. Did not give a know, shit. Fair enough. Well, and on that We note, love all that. That's why yeah. ACAB. We love we love <laughs> ML, we love truck. Jason likes furries. Stop. You said furries? It's an important political you furries? It's a important yeah, political base. Yeah, supporters of Grover Fur. Grover Fur. <laughs> from now on, from now on you're not a Stalinist, you're a furry. You're a Grover furry. Yeah, but yeah. Just deal with it. That's what you are and that's what I'm going to call you. Oh, oh, there's furries in the chat. That's what I'm saying. Haroon. Did you get like a really bad message one time when someone says, I really didn't appreciate you guys making fun of like alternative creative sexual lifestyles? That was really kind hey, of. We're not making fun of furries. <laughs> we're making fun of people who of read Grover Fur. Grover Furries. It's very different. Grover. Very no, different. someone got serious. They're like, you don't understand the furry lifestyle. I was like, look, i sorry. Don't want to understand it. I'm just saying. It's fine. It, whatever you I had do. had a guy cool, in. Cool. I had a guy in the Warhammer shop explain it to me. He was very sad. He said, if I was gay, I could find someone to yiff with of just in one night. And he said, but I can't find any female yiffers. And I was like, I don't know what yiffing is. 
And please don't try to explain it now. <laughs> I can show you way better than I could tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> All right, we gotta fucking go, man. We we've been talking too long. This is insane. Say goodbye, guys. Are you, all right, is everyone ready to hear a wonderful little song I made for my child while watching the cartoons of my childhood? Enjoy. <laughs>